Hey, Julian, how's it going? Hey, good morning. Can you guys hear me well? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks so much again for doing this. I'll, uh, no yeah, problem. Gonna... It's a good day. I mean, uh, we have no ORs today, so it's perfect. You know, initially, uh, you know, you made it earlier because I thought I'd be in the OR, but uh, I'll be good. I have lots of time if you guys need. Perfect. I guess not perfect for the OR, but. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, it's good. it's good to have a little physically uh, a lighter day. Good, good. We can all use that. Yeah, that's good. So this is your your weekly uh, grand rounds, or it's your half day teaching, basically. Yeah, weekly half day, academic half day. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, every every Wednesday morning. Um, so like half of the time we have um, like the CCFP uh, plus one program as well. Um, so sometimes our our attendance doesn't double, but it, you know it's bigger. Um, but we still have, uh, like most of the eMERGE program is like comes to these rounds. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a combination of programs usually. That's perfect. So almost all of you guys are the, for the MU5 and sometimes you have the plus one. Yeah. Sometimes. So, so yeah. 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 Um, I usually like showing a quote of the day, but now I'm going to stop sharing my screen so then you can uh, you can take over. <laughs> oh, some people here. I see Audrey, I see Seth, I see Mathieu. I saw most of you guys. Here. And you, you, usual attendance is uh, what should we should we expect? Uh, so typically uh, we get so for for these rounds like uh, today, like we'll probably get to around twenty, hopefully about twenty five um, to thirty, Perfect. maybe more. Um, I usually give the group an extra three minutes <laughs> after eight or after starting time just to kind of start trickling in. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then and then we'll get going. That's good. You guys are, are you guys are more punctual than us. That's good. <laughs> some of us are. <laughs> we still have, well, we still have some stragglers who, who come in later. <laughs> when are your rounds typically? Uh, Thursday. Thursday half okay. Oh yeah, right. I remember that. Yeah, I was on trauma, and there was um an ortho resident who would uh yeah yeah on Friday on uh, Thursdays. <laughs> Yeah, I'll share my screen. You guys can see that? Yes, yeah, full screen. All right, awesome. I'll wait a couple of minutes, we'll wait a minute. Will be uh, some sort of an interactive uh, talk in a sense that I know some of you guys, so don't feel bad if I pick on you. Just is just because I know your name, and and the goal of this talk is really to discuss with you guys on what are the things that you think uh, are urgent. You know, what are the MSK emergencies? Perfect. And usually, there's I always tell I give the same talk to the uh, starting residents. Uh, so the, oh, nice. So the starting residents in ortho, you need to know in the evening, if you guys call them for certain diagnoses, what are the top 10 diagnoses that they actually have to like red alarm, uh, be aware, go and see the patient, you know? So that's, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to see if what we think is an emergency, you guys also agree on that. Yep. All right. So shall we go? Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, I think we are, yeah, I think we have an adequate number for you to, to, Get off and running, and and also just to let you know, we're um we record these rounds. No is is that you're you're okay with that? No problem. Okay, great, thanks. All right, so I'm Julien. I'm a fourth year resident, uh, currently the trauma chief in ortho, managing all the logistics of the all the trauma patients and the high volume we get at the MGH. Uh, I love trauma. I love the general. So 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 it's a pleasure for me to help you guys. Uh, with uh, any questions for ortho emergencies and all the MSK emergencies, and not only trauma, but also spine. Um, so, so goal of this talk is, like I just said, is identify diagnoses that require a rapid response from ortho. 
And, and especially after hours, after midnight, when you're on call uh, as a resident in ortho, you want to know what are the things I need to go and see. Same thing for you guys after midnight, what are the things I really need ortho for? And then I wanted to, for, for these top 10 diagnoses, for all the diagnoses to just uh, pick your brain on what are the, let's say the top three things, let's say I tell you a certain diagnosis, what are the top three things I could ask the patient or labs or imaging that would help me with the diagnosis of the time. And in MSK, I also just want to, for those that are a bit anxious or have a bit of questioning in MSK, just MSK is simple. It's often biomechanics, pathoanatomy. And if you understand the anatomy, you'll understand the diagnosis and treatment plan. So stay systematic and everything will be fine. And also uh, just, just tell you guys again how, how available we are and how, how for us, ortho, we're always happy to help, even though we're busy, even after midnight for any reduction, please, uh, we'll have a great collaboration and call us for that. So, so I want you to think of diagnoses that need a consultation after midnight and the top three questions or information or imaging or top three aspect of the pathology that would be needed. So we'll go top to bottom. Uh, let me just switch my screen here. I don't see. Okay, so so basically, I'll I'll pick on you guys. Think just out of your head. Think of the diagnosis that for you uh, would be urgent. I saw Audrey. Audrey, are you online? Just t tell me a diagnosis you think ortho should assess. The compartment syndrome. Perfect. Good one. Anybody else? I saw. Any that. open fracture. Open fracture, good point, good point. We can discuss about that. Ah, that's Mustafa. What's up, Mustafa? Good to see you. Hey, brother. Good, good to see you. How are you? Yeah, very good. So, so open fracture is a good one. Uh, we'll discuss because it might be less urgent than you think. Any, anything else? I, have, I need 10. We're at two right now. You guys are good for so far. F femur fracture. Very good. Very good. We'll go over that. Anything else? Neurovascular compromise. Okay, so I heard cauda that's good. So th that cauda can almost fit in a uh, spinal cord injury. I can give you this one also. Very good. And then I heard neurovascular compromise. Uh, I don't know who said that. Was that Seth? Yeah, that was me. Sorry, there's a... No problem, Seth. So, so when you say neurovascular compromise, uh, what are you thinking? I guess like a, a dislocation. No. Sorry. Uh, I guess like a uh, dislocation that... Uh, um, where you have any neurovascular compromise or a fracture that after you've reduced it, it still like uh, has compromised. Excellent. So, so that for me is an ortho emergency and we'll discuss that. Let's say there's a penetrative injury and the brachial artery is gone. Although for me, it's urgent. Ortho wise, I don't have the skills to do that. That's a vascular issue. Same thing for nerves. We're not microsurgeons. However, if there's a knee dislocation, like you just said, and there's vascular compromise, uh, I need to help you out. Anything yeah, else? fashion and uh, one of the limbs i mean very the hand sometimes it goes to plastics but uh, lower limb by i guess it goes to you guys very good very good so that's that is a medical emergency and to totally a medical uh emergency that needs surgical intervention very good anything else and let's see we're talking about infection speaking of infection anything else Se septic joint very good septic oh, joint. osteomyelitis yeah osteomyelitis we can uh, we can talk about it for me uh, I've never operated in the middle of the uh, osteomyelitis. They're rarely uh, hemodynamically compromised. It's rarely an emergency. It is an orthopedic, uh, uh, let's say, uh, pathology. However, middle of the night, unfortunately, I'll say, okay, uh, unless he's uh, dying and he needs source control, uh, it's not something we would see overnight. So we'll focus on those that would, you think are really urgent. So septic joint, if it's a let's say a pediatric patient, a young patient that has cartilage uh, that, that we need to save, definitely septic joint is an emergency. I think well, that's 10, that, so you guys are good. Like we, I could end the talk right now, right now but we'll see what uh, you guys know in all of these, uh, all of these uh, diagnoses. But that, this is uh, the usual top 10. So let's start with the head. So ortho, we don't touch it. So don't cause for anything around the head. So next, next step around the spine. So spinal cord inj injury, definitely, definitely an emergency. Classic story will be a whatever motocross, uh, motorcycle crash, the guy comes in and he's paralyzed. So for you guys, um, I think who, who told the spinal cord injury earlier? I think somebody said, I don't know who, but whoever said, spinal cord, okay, whoever said spinal cord injury, tell me what are the high yield 
clinical infold or high yield um, uh, pathoanatomy or uh, physical exam or imaging that for you would uh, dictate the, 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 the orientation or the treatment plan of this patient? Well, you can always ask if there's a, a trauma, but there's there's like those red flags questions that you have for like back pain that are usually those that I ask you syst uh, systematically. So like uh, if there is a history of trauma, if then they have some sort of a level, whatever, with paresthesias or weakness, uh, if they have saddle uh, anesthesia, if they have uh, urinary incontinence by overflow or if they have uh, fecal incontinence very good uh, so that's very good this would be more for lumbar and i think i have a slide on uh, cauda equina itself so that will be used definitely these are very good clinical uh, findings for for lumbar uh, lumbar sacral pathology and let's say i tell you it's a cervical spine fracture dislocation are you aware, aware of any score have you ever seen the spine consult or notice what, what's on the spine? Asia. Consult? Perfect. So for me, spinal cord injury equals Asia score. You need to see, is the guy totally paralyzed? Is it a complete spinal cord injury? Is it an incomplete spinal cord injury? So the, the, the scope of the talk is not to review all of this because that could be an entire talk. However, if you're talking spinal cord injury, you should have a reflex stating Asia score is bang. If you call ortho saying that, that's a big plus because we already know what we're talking about. If it's a complete injury, uh, so that we need to know. Um, and then in the same category in the Asia score, and if you print a spine consult and you emerge, you'll see it's it's like dumb proof. You know, it's all explained. The neuro exam is explained, and it's going to tell you check if there's a spinal shock or neurogenic shock. So you guys need to differentiate. Uh, do the difference between uh, both of those. So I think Antoine, you were speaking. So if I tell you what's the difference between a spinal shock and a neurogenic shock. Did you know? Not sure 100%, but uh, from what I re remember, I think spinal shock is when actually they kind of lose the ability to walk or like the, the weakness in the limbs because of the impact and the shock the, that the nerves received. Mm -hmm. A neurogenic shock is somewhat similar, but then it's more like um, you have uh, more a central change with your vitals. Like uh, it will affect your BP and uh, you will have uh, also your heart rate. I think it's good. I think you're on a good track. I, I think you're, you're the thing to remember is that neurogenic shock is a real shock in a sense that, like you said, it will affect the physiology, the the oxygen transport because of the parasympathetic control of the blood vessels, you can get that from a spinal cord injury above, uh, usually it's around mid thoracic spine. And spinal shock is more of a stunned uh, spinal cord that suddenly becomes flaccid. And then you think it's a complete spinal cord injury, but it's not. So for me, high yield question infos would be Asia score, uh, spinal shock, neurogenic shock, and then ortho-wise, well, we, for sure we analyze imaging, seeing is it a spinal cord injury with no bony injury, like sometimes we see in the elderly, elderly, or is it a complete fracture dislocation? So for sure, having an understanding of the, I, I always give the analogy of the building and the electric system. Is, if the electric system is gone, but the building is stable, it's a different story that if the electric system is gone and the building is, is collapsed. Okay, so, so very good, Antoine. So Asia score, get a proper exam. Uh, remember your dermatome, myotome. Um, we shouldn't, if we're talking about spinal cord injury, injury, we shouldn't talk about radial nerve, ulnar nerve, don't talk about that, talk about myotomes. You know, you need to do, make a big difference between a central neuro exam and an appendicular neuro exam, big difference. And then or, ortho-wise, uh, we have some scores for the building, like I told you to assess the stability the stability of the fracture or dislocation. So these are things that if you know, could alert you, okay, this is a very urgent one. But overall, anytime you get a spinal cord injury, uh, we should have an urgent assessment by spine. Any questions on spinal cord injury? No, thanks. Okay. So that's going to be the format. Obviously, I won't go in details in Asia score. This PowerPoint, I'll give it to you if you want. These are the, the top three or four things for every pathology 
that if you know, you're in business. And, and the details, they'll come eventually and, and often they are more like surgical planning, but this is clinical assessment and uh, patient orientation. So the second one was septic joint. I think, was it Mustafa? Was it you for septic joint? Um, I was uh, Nick Fash, but- uh... oh, Who said septic joint? I think it was me too. Oh, Antoine, okay, you're in trouble, man. Uh, so, so septic joint, so high yield questions, a high yield information for you for a septic joint. Uh, systemic symptoms. So fever, chills, nausea, vomiting. Um, what else? How do you diagnose it? What's, what's the, how, how's the diagnosis made? With systemic symptoms and with joint pain. And, and, and often, let's say there's an effusion, uh, what does often rheumatology us or you guys should do if ever you're somewhere that you don't have portal? You can tap it. Yeah, exactly. Tap and do you remember your, um, your diagnostic criteria? For like how many polymorphs uh, in, yeah. the, in the, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't remember the number. You don't need the number, but as, as long as you remember that you should, you that classic table between inflammatory, infectious, uh, normal fluid, sign of the fluid, just remember that table and that's it. That's a septic joint. If you suspect it, tap it, send the fluid for cell count for that polymorph, send the fluid for culture and gram. That's it. That's a septic joint. And then you need to prove it. And if it's a young patient, heart, you, need, you need a wash up. So for septic joint, I would tell you is in sepsis, add some labs in there. Uh, remember your arthrosynthesis techniques for all the joints. And you guys are so slick now with your ultrasound. Uh, we're trying to follow the, the wave. I mean, in clinic now we can do hip uh, ultrasound aspiration, uh, but for even without ultrasound, you should know your landmarks for shoulder, elbow, wrist, hip, knee, ankle. And then ideally all the antibiotics before uh, doing the tap. Um, and then, like I just said, cell count, gram stain, fluid culture, and crystals. Often we forget crystals. You can get gout, gout with superimposed uh, infection. You can get uh, just gout. You can get CPPD. So, so these are things to think of. And again, if it's confirmed with the septic diagnosis, there's 50,000 is the magic number. It's 50,000 by, by uh, uh, cubic millimeters or milliliters. Uh, so if you get that, well, then you need to wash up. Okay, questions on septic joint? Yeah, I have a question, Julian. Um, yeah. I know, I, you know, I was just doing some reading recently and they were talking about uh, the high, uh, well, not necessarily high incidence, but incidence of overlap between patients that have a crystal arthropathy that may also have a septic joint as well. And sort of, even if you see crystals not sort of stopping and saying, okay, this is an inflammatory uh, monoarthritis, but still thinking about a septic uh, joint. If you have this sort of like crystal arthropathy and like a, a not completely diagnostic white count, say like, I don't know, 40 or 50 or something like that, mm -hmm. do you still treat it as a, when do you sort of decide that it's a septic joint? What, what kind of information do you use if you don't have like a culture that's positive or a gram stain? Very good point. So let's say the situation would have gram and culture negative, but like 40,000 of, of polymorph um, and then some crystals on the analysis. I think in this situation, uh, it's case by case. And often these septic joints are not the, the book presentation. Like we have one right now. Uh, it's like, uh, I think it's only CPPD on the shoulder and he's very sick. I think he coded at the vein. Now he's transferred here and they want us to wash it. The guy is very, very sick. So now you have to stop and think, what are you treating? You have to think also at the joint, is there any cartilage to save? So I was telling the, the juniors yesterday, like, what are we trying to achieve for this patient? Is it, is it, does he need a washout because he's septic? That we can do. Uh, does he need a washout because there's a, there's a, there's a young person, let's say your patient was young. Young patient with gout and maybe infection, there's good cartilage, we don't want to mess it up. And if he's healthy, uh, knee scope or shoulder scope, whatever, it's, it's a small operation. The debate comes when the patient is very sick, like this one we have right now on the floor, 
very sick and the surgery is not benign. Your shoulder surgery, needing a general anesthesia, is not benign. And plus, he has no cartilage to save. So there's nothing to rush. He, he, the cartilage. So that's when the situation, you take everything into account and kind of do the pros and cons. And it's not that easy. And you know what? Sometimes we take those gouts for washout, take the fluid out, and then send for the fluid and culture is 14 days negative. So, okay, it was a gout. But that's, I prefer being wrong than missing it. But I would tell you that the tough calls are the ones that are really sick. They're not septic. Numbers are like whatever. CRP is like 20. And these are the tough ones. And then they're always like that. So these are like the ambiguous of it. Uh, case i don't know if it answered your question yeah i mean i guess it sounds like uh there's not a clear answer no, exactly it's i'm telling you it's a tough call the easy one or like the whatever 25 years old uh iv drug or something happened and then suddenly big swollen knee painful positive tab there's pus you know classic that's easy you just wash and then antibiotics but then when it's a, a sick patient maybe gal maybe cppd maybe milwaukee shoulder and then ugh, this bad. <laughs> tough call. So sometimes we just do it, but uh, it's, a, it's a tough call. I see Dr. Doyle. Yeah, quick question for you. How sensitive is passive range of motion to rule out septic joint? I think, I think on a young patient with no arthritis, it is. I think somebody, let's say somebody comes in walking, for me, it would be very surprising to get a septic joint. He can, for sure. You'll get, uh, you'll get cases like this, but the septic joint is painful. And before doing the tap, you'll get your clinical sense that, oh boy, there's something wrong with this knee. The knee is swollen. He can't range it, first of all, because it's full of pus. Uh, same thing for the olecranon. Uh, the olecranon bursa is going to be stuck like this, and he can't extend, can't flex because it's full of pus. So you have your clinical sensing that passive range of motion. It's warm. At the redness, not always, but definitely effusion. You need an effusion. And then that's the effusion that you'll tap. So I would tell you that, yes, before doing the tap, clinical uh, picture is very useful. Any other question for septic joint? Uh, Julian, um, what, what we, uh, as you said, uh, the, uh, my understanding is having an effusion is, is a major part of making the diagnosis. And we kind of use this, um, my understanding is uh, along with pocus to kind of roll in or out a septic, uh, septic joint. So I guess my question, if there is no effusion, my understanding is it's much less likely to be a septic joint. I, I just want to be sure that I, I understood this correctly. Yeah, you, I, you can still get a septic joint, but I would be, let's say you have a negative tab, there's nothing in there. And then your classic answer from IR will be a, a droplets of serosanguinous uh, liquid. I mean, like, you can still get an osteo, you can still get the um, purine myositis, you, know, you, can, you can get stuff around the joint, but it's, it's usually it goes not in favor of septic joint. Thank you. <clears throat> And also in, for us, not for you guys, but for us, we need to think of our treatment. Let's say there's nothing in the joint. What are we doing? We're just gonna open the capsule and look at it. So, so, so when you, we do a washout is to actual, actually remove the pus and remove something. So that's why in terms of surgery, we're, we're trying to achieve something. So that's uh, all good points for septic joint. Thanks for the question. So next one, uh, let's talk about uh, dislocations. I think it was Seth. Seth earlier, we talked about knee dislocation. So, so high yield questions or clinical infos for you for, for, for joint dislocation? Um, I guess the joint obviously first, um, and then, uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a artificial joint and then, uh, you know, do you have a, is it neurovascularly and skin intact? I guess would be the, the main thing. That's it, as simple as this. Uh, this is a common uh, common problem. You guys see a lot, reduce a lot. And what would be the concerning dislocation? If we have time before, at the end of the, the, the talk, I have good cases that came over the last couple of months uh, when, I was, when I'm in trauma, we can review it. But what are the concerning um, joints that are dislocated and why? So I guess uh, the knee um, with the popliteal uh, um, involvement. Mm -hmm. Um, an elbow potentially with like radial or ulnar nerve. Uh, sure. Less, I would say less. And what else? Big joints. Hip. Yeah, for sure. Why? 
I'm not sure uh, which is your uh, big vessel or nerve that's most affected. It was the big nerve in the back of the hip. Is it just your sciatic then? That's, yeah, uh, there's yeah. sciatic and there's also the, the, when you get a dislocation of the hip, it's not a small trauma. And often you get some capsular um, insult of the vessel and you can get AVN as well uh, in the long term. So for sure joint, I always tell the junior resident, if it doesn't look like a limb, make it look like a limb, no matter the x-rays, no matter what, if you get this knee, don't get an x-ray. Just, you will never do anything wrong. There's maybe one or two situations when a reduction can cause something wrong. But if you see that, if you see a limb that doesn't look like a limb, a hip that's dislocated, you can always pull on it. And I call that intelligent traction. So sometimes it looks like ortho just pulling like monkeys. But do we actually understand we need, and you guys also understand like shoulders, you need to understand uh, where is the bone. Uh, so right, right now, this knee is in what we call valgus. So, so guess what? If you want to reduce it, you'll need traction and varus. Same thing for a hip. So a, the classic deformity of a hip set is, is well, I can ask you that. What's the, is it the usual hip dislocation is anterior posterior hip? Posterior. Yeah, so the classic dashboard who made, I think who made said it. So classic dashboard will be posterior. What, what will be what will be the deformity when it's posterior of the patient? You'll find the patient in which position in the stretcher? Uh, I think it will be like shortening of the limb with the external rotation or internal one. Of, yeah, I don't remember exactly. <laughs> so that's it. So that's it's fine. So that's good. So external rotation when there's a fracture and hip dislocation is internal. So just thinking of your concept of exaggerating the movement and traction and reducing. If it's an internal and short, guess what will be your reduction maneuver? It will be flexion, internal rotation to unlock and then traction and then bring it back. So that's why I'm, I'm telling you, if you understand the pantoanatomy of the injury, you'll be able to reduce it just by understanding the displacement and the same it's the same uh, mechanism, let's say for shoulders, shoulders often in the front and ABD and external rotation. So guess what? What we're doing often when we're reducing a shoulder, we're exaggerating the, the deformity, more external, we're unlocking the humeral head and then bringing it back in with traction. But long story short, pull on it and make it look like a limb and everybody will be happy. And then- Julien. I'll, yes, please. So sorry. Uh, we were discussing the like one or two situation where like stat reduction without getting prior image or stretch can cause problem. Could we go over that? Because I guess that's my main concern. And even that, even then, it would not even be your fault. So the, the case I'm thinking is in pediatrics, you get an elbow dislocation and you'll get the medial epicondyle that's fractured often. With the medial epicondyle goes the ulnar nerve. And when you bring back the elbow together, sometimes the epicondyle stays in the joint and that, that, that crushes the ulnar nerve. I think I was in R2 and I got that. And the guy was uh, 19 years old. It was at the gen, actually. It was at the gen, but had the pediatric type of injury. Epicondyle fracture with elbow dislocation. I reduced it. And when I went to see him, he had ulnar clawing like this. He was stuck like this. He couldn't feel his ulnar nerve. And I said, shit, get the x-ray, pulse reduction. And indeed the epicondyle was in there. But again, there's no technique, I mean, none that I'm aware to prevent that. It's kind of bad luck. And if we get that, it's not permanent. And then indeed we address it right away. But you get way more damage if you leave a, let's say a hip dislocated, like the case I'm gonna show you, or like a knee dislocated, just waiting for the x-ray. Uh, you get the perineal nerve tenting and damage, but it's gonna get dropped for forever. So I would tell you, if it doesn't look like a limb, make it look like a limb, sedation, pull, and then get the x-ray. And then hip, like Seth said, uh, you got to check for femoral neck uh, lesion. There might be some cases that we need imaging before and need dislocation. Think of your ABI. But often right now, we're really fast, especially here at the gen with that CTA. And for any time you have any questions for reduction, please ask or report. Questions on uh, joint dislocation? Uh, that might sound like a dumb question, but any knee dislocation will get us will get a CTA, right? Uh, no, no, I, you know, oh. we do it here, but technically the textbook, if probably same thing would be 
ABI before, ABI after, and if it's less than 0.9, you do your CTA. And that's a textbook answer. But now, often we're just, it's so easy to get the CTA, you just might as well get it, you know? It's easier to get a CTA to get a, and get a Doppler and get a proper ABI. You know? But uh, that's our reality. And then, yeah, you just review how to do your ABI. You can do it your blood pressure cuff with the nurses. So these are easy stuff to do to document uh, medical legal. Okay. And oh, do you ahead. still do you still apply the same kind of traction if you if you suspect that there's a fracture with the uh, with the dislocation? Yeah, yeah, and and I would tell you that maybe uh, except hip no joint reduction should be very difficult. If it's very difficult, something's wrong with the sedation or something wrong with your technique. In a sense that if you, like I told you, if you understand the technique, usually you don't pull like crazy. Usually you unlock the fragment, pull it down. Same thing for fractures. So un unless, except hip, hip sometimes you do, it's a big bone. You, you need to stabilize the pelvis. You're pulling like crazy. That's the only case you're pulling hard, but the rest of it, it should be pretty smooth. I rarely, rarely, uh, sweat a lot. Same thing for an ankle, you know, when you start as an R1 or you, know, you do ankles, you sweat and it's difficult. But then if you understand, let's say the, the ankle is out posterior laterally, then push posterior laterally to enter medially. And you can push uh, with a lighter pressure, but just understand what you're doing. And then for sure, you have, you have the same result that if you just squeeze crazy, uh, like a sandwich, just to squeeze it out again. So let's talk, uh, we're four, four out of the nine, so we're doing good. So let's talk next fast. So high yield questions, info scores, are you aware of any clinical scores or what should we do with the next fast? I think it was uh, Mustafa. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I guess my high yield questions will be uh, if there is uh, erythema or skin changes, how, how fast they were spreading, if the patient is doing systemic, systematically and well, if there is uh, tenderness to passive stretch and if there is crepitus um, and then if I'm not very sure and the CT looking for air uh, so these are going to be my clinical questions uh, for the score there is a learning score but my understanding is um, I think it's not sensitive enough or it's specific like in, in, in real clinical practice uh, at least for us uh, we don't use it much I don't know if you guys uh, use it and how, how how do you base your decision based on it so that's it. So you, I'm glad you said it. So I think for me, I don't, I, I use the variables of the score. I don't use the score per se. And like you said, for me, I'll take it as in a broad picture. If the patient is very sick, if he has glucose out of whack, sodium out of, out of whack, uh, he's, if, these are all things that will alert you. Um, and like you said, clinical presentation, crepitus, the only thing I would disagree with you would be imaging. I know we still do it to provide a bit of help, um, but I'm not sure it's, it's, it's really helping. I think if we had easier, and we should have easier access to ORN, if you have any suspicion, we should just go in and do just a fasciotomy, open, look at the fascia, look at the muscle. And if the muscle is alive, that's it. It's a cellulitis, it's not, it's not a neck fascia. I think we should we should be like we shouldn't be sorry of opening up the leg with a small incision and just making sure it's not a neck fascia. Uh, so for me, that the neck fascia is a clinical diagnosis with labs and clinical picture, patient being sick and sepsis, and then in, involve ID, involve plastics, gen surge, ortho, start antibiotics, and even now they give EGG. So all this stuff uh, is, is all this stuff is for neck fascia. And yes, the score, but like I said, I'm mostly using the, the, the variables rather than the score itself. And then, like I said, when in doubt, just take to the OR. It's better safe than sorry. We did one uh, last week at the VIC. I went to the VIC uh, for a young lady diabetic. I'm not sure cellulitis or not. Just didn't take any chance. We did fasciotomies. The muscle was alive. Close it up. That's it. It's a cellulitis and there's no harm, no harm there. But if we missed it, that would be bad. And advanced imaging, we, we still do it sometimes on equivocal cases, but I don't think uh, it's a textbook answer. Perfect question. Julian, I have a question. Like if you open the, the cellulite that won't cause like separate to the infection and may cause neck fash in the future or something like that. 
Uh, I've, I never got a case like that. And uh, I, I would be really surprised. I uh, would be really surprised. Usually uh, you can be drained. And if it's not plausible because of swelling, you can you can just do a, uh, just a packing, iodine sponge packing, go back in two days. Surgically, it's not a, a problem, I would say. For sure, you, you follow the patient. You know, if he's still, she's still sick and develops something worse, then you, you go back. But uh, now we're more talking about the first 24 hours. Uh, Julien, mm -hmm. what would be what's the most subtle case of neck fash you've had? Because it's not always like that impressive in textbook, right? That's the. It's so. I mean, I had one that for sure it wasn't neck fash, and I was with the staff, and he said, "You know what? It's been like two weeks, whatever." Came went to the OR. The fascia was all liquefied. It was really surprising, and she wasn't sick. She wasn't septic. So that was, I would say, the most weird case I had, but. Again, uh, it was mostly like slow progressing. Uh, I think it's a spectrum. For me, I think neck fascia is a spectrum in the sense that this one was not very sick, but it did have some facial involvement. So yes, I had a case like this, uh, but the real ones are the ones that are rapidly progressing. You get in there, the muscle is all liquefied, the fascia is liquefied. And these are a case that need rapid amputation or fasciectomy uh, rather than just fasciotomies. Yeah. So next diagnosis would be open fracture. So high yield questions, classifications. Uh, what are your management of open fractures? I don't know who said an open fracture, I forgot. Whoever said open fracture, you could. Uh... Yeah, it was me. Okay, go Mustafa. So uh, my high yield questions will be, um, um, when did the fracture happen? If there, uh, how much um, uh, debris is, uh, or contamination is there on the fracture? Is there is neurovascular compromise? And the classification, uh, the name doesn't come to my head now, but it, uh, it, it ha the main components is how large is the, the open fracture? So less than one centimeter, more than one centimeter. And then as far as I remember, if, if less, you start cephazodin. If it's more, then you start cephazodin with gentamicin. Exactly. And then, Exactly, and you call ortho, and, and uh, as you said, Julian, um, I mean, uh, I think you guys can wait up to eight hours or something like that. It's not like I have to take it to the OR now, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then you said but, neurovascular, and like any other fractures, uh, what are what, what is another complication you want to rule out, even though it's an open fracture? Compartment syndrome. Yeah, just a reminder that you can still get compartment with an open injury. Nice. Okay, so I think you said it all. The classification is Gustio. Um, so remember your opening, the site, is it a poke hole? Is it uh, less than 10? Is it more than 10? If it's more than 10, is there plastics? The, the 3B and 3C is more intraoperative. If we realize the defect is too big and we need plastics, it becomes a 3B. And 3C uh, is when there's vascular involvement. Indeed, yeah, uh, you can review the classification. You can add aminoglycosid. Just remember your tetanus in your exam and in real life also. And then if it's a farming injury, you can add penicillin. And again, open fractures, uh, I still may placed it in, in the like overnight urgent diagnosis, but nowadays, unless it's a mangled extremity with an unstable patient, these open fractures, if they're splinted, realign, antibiotics, tetanus, they can wait up to 24 hours without any issues. For sure, we don't do that. But just in terms of if you're alone and you don't have any ortho, Stay calm, reduce the joints, start antibiotics, um, make sure there's no vascular involvement, and that's it. Neurovascular involvement, and, and that's it. You check for compartment, and you can easily wait for appropriate surgical care uh, if, when needed. So that would be for open fractures. Uh, Julien, yeah. I guess the idea of calling during the night is as well making sure that you guys have a spot during the day for it. Absolutely, absolutely. And please continue to do it. The reason I'm telling you is, let's say you're in uh, rotating in uh, whatever, uh, but let's say Gaspésie and you don't have any ortho, I don't want you to, uh, you know, I want you to stay calm, uh, reach for appropriate coverage in the Rimouski or whatever, and send the patient whenever you have time. Uh, it's more for you to realize that these are the, now the guidelines, but antibiotics, early administrator of antibiotics is very important. And also I placed there that femur is always a G3 in a sense that to break a femur, it, the amount of energy needed is so significant that in our conferences, uh, the trauma guys, they say that a, 
a fracture of the femur is a soft tissue injury with a broken bone underneath. So to break the femur, the muscle, the, the, the periosteum, the fascia, all in there is all bruised up. So when you get even a poke hole of the femur, we still treat it, uh, treat it as a G3 with nine liters of in, in the OR, huge debridement, uh, not only like a little poke hole of the form that we just put a bit of water and never gets infected. The point of the story is if you get an open femur, that's two urgent diagnosis that needs to be treated. And it, give, it gives you a sense of the amount of energy that went through the, the trauma. Can you just uh, tell us how do we differentiate exactly a two from a three A? Like what's the... Technically it's 10 centimeters, the size, but it's, it, it's, it's not a big uh, problem. It's more intraoperative. We can uh, uh, gauge it, but it's mostly the size and the defect in the periosteum. But 3A will be able to close primarily rooted. Two and three A's are orthopedic management. And then 3B, we need plastics for coverage. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just in terms of um, like bedside irrigation, should we be spending a lot of time irrigating these? Like when we see them, should we? I, I do it. I, li I like doing it. I feel better, but all the staff, they tell us it's, it's not needed. But if the patient, let's say we had a recently, a couple of, I don't know if you guys were involved, but lawnmower accident with like grass and rocks in there. I mean, won't, uh, yes, okay, maybe antibiotics is important, but for me, like let's remove a bit of grass, a bit of rocks in the emerge while waiting for the for the final surgery. So I still do it. Um, I'm really I'm more new are now, but whenever I have a case, I'll, I'll irrigate. So please do it just a bit. Just remove. I would say remove in the exam. You can say remove gross debris, uh, splint and realign tetanus antibiotics. Hmm. But I don't think in the in the if you have a question and it it says what's your next. Uh, management say antibiotics don't say i'll be uh, irrigating in the emerge cool uh so cara equina we talked earlier uh i think how was it i don't know who said i think it was it was not one anyway so so cara equina you can consider it as a spinal cord injury uh because it is a spinal cord injury caused by a disc hernia often um, so what would be the high yield questions or your cl classic uh, syndrome of a cardiac coiner? I'm not sure if Antoine is still there. I'm there. Um, so yeah, it's uh, a bit like those I've asked, uh, well, I said it earlier. So if there is um, urinary retention with overflow um, incontinence, if they have fecal incontinence, saddle uh, paresthesia, yeah. And then uh, if they have weakness in the lower extremities with the level, uh, and also you, you do check the reflexes and strength. And Very good. So the same you'll see on our spine consult, like I said, it's done proof. You do your exam, you, you check if it's compatible. And the important part is to remember that cauda equina is a syndrome. It's a clinical presentation. Even though you have a big L5S1 disc, if the patient has the diculopathy it's, and the MRI says possible cauda equina, it doesn't matter. It's a clinical presentation and it's exactly what you just described. So like, so even though you have this, this big disc of 5S1, it's not, and it says maybe cauda equina, it's, a, it's your picture, it's your clinical exam uh, with back or leg pain, radiculopathy, with saddle anesthesia, rear, urine retention. I'm glad you said to watch for the overflow incontinence. It's a common, uh, presentation and now we're pretty good with the bladder scan to uh, assess that and sphincter dysfunction with uh, rectal exam and uh, treat it as a spinal cord injury like I said so if it's an acute disc with acute cauda equina you don't have persistent neural insult so you remove the decompression simple as that uh, but again just clinical picture ask for an MRI based on your clinical picture not the opposite don't do a clinical exam due to the findings on the MRI Questions? Okay. I, I guess here it can be caused by a disc, but it can also be caused by, I know me in my questionnaire, usually I, I go, I see it by causes. As for the rest of the question, I ask for the symptoms and then I ask for everything that could explain a cause. So the trauma, if there is infection as an abscess could cause it too. So okay. systemic symptoms there. And if he's on any anticoagulation, just as he could have a hematoma too. 
Yeah, and then another cause that uh, would fit in there would be cancer. You know, you can have a chordoma, a big cancer, a sacrum, and then get a cardiacoin representation. So that's why it, it's 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 a syndrome. It's a clinical diagnosis, and then the cause of it is a different story, and it's part of the treatment plan. Good. Pelvic ring injury, very interesting. So what are your high yield question, high, uh, high yield uh, intervention? What are stuff you look for for these big injuries? I'm not sure anybody said it, so maybe uh, anybody can step in. Is it stable? Oh, I'm glad you said that. How are you gonna, how are you gonna assess that? Um, First well, of all, what's stable? You, you're talking of the patient or the pelvis? The, the pelvis okay oh, the, pa the patient too i guess okay. maybe, maybe more importantly okay yeah exactly so tell me how you would assess the stability of the patient hemodynamically and then tell me how you would assess the stability of the pelvis um well you know in terms of the patient is there uh any signs of like uh like hypotension tachycardia just like any signs of shock of, of a bleed I guess would be your major concern, obviously, with the, the pelvis. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you, is it usually venous or arterial, arterial bleeding? I believe it's usually venous. Okay, very good. Um, okay, good. And just your usual ATLS protocol to break your pelvis, you need a massive trauma. So you have to rule out other stuff, Euro, urogenital, uh, belly, spine, just usual ATLS stuff. Okay. And in terms of stability of the pelvis, let's say you have an x-ray, you did your ETLS and your uh, primary adjuncts, you get your x-ray pelvis. What do you do next? I mean, I guess if you've palpated it, is there like, a, is it physically unstable? Like, can you move the pelvis? Would be probably my first thought about it before I even got the x-ray. Mm. And then on the x-ray, like, are there signs of uh, like an unstable pelvis? So like a vertical shear type uh, uh, fracture. Um, I'm forgetting my uh, classification, uh, but I think it's mostly like vertical instability would be more concerning than the, than the horizontal, but, uh, or like a rotational injury on the pelvis. So you're very good. So, so the classification that I think is very useful for you guys with pathoanatomy of the injury is the, the young and burgies. So if you see the pelvis like a ring, either you can squeeze it. So that's an LC or lateral compression. And if you open it, it becomes an open book. And if you got both, it's a vertical shear. So that's a good thing to remember. And for me, that dictates the stability of the pelvis. Um, I know in the ATLS it says to test the pelvis, but for me, we're not achieving anything in a sense that if, if it's unstable and let's say there was a clot preventing the bleeding and you just unclogged it and then there's gonna be a pelvic bleed or a venous uh, clot that's gonna just start bleeding again. Second of all, it won't change your management. So if it's unstable, uh, it doesn't change what you'll do next. If, the, if it's stable, but there's still a fracture, it won't change anything. So for me, this, the testing the pelvis is done usually intra-op when we have pins in the pelvis and we're seeing how it's moving. In the trauma bay, just get the x-ray, see if there's a fracture, see if there's pubic symphysis widening, and that's it. You know if it's unstable. Then you go to the algorithm, okay, it's an open book and the guy's tachycardic. Now, we, now we, what do you do next? If the guy's an open book pelvic ring injury and he's tachycardic set, what do you do? In, in trauma bay. So you're gonna bind the pelvis. Very good. So that's it. So so so. That's why for me, testing it, you're not achieving a lot. Uh, personally, I find it also, you know, not dangerous, but I, I don't know, I, I just don't do it. I look at the x-ray, see if it's an unstable fracture, and if it is, treat it accordingly. And if it's an open book that you can help with closing the book, well, you do it with a binder. And if it's an LC type, and it's all squished like that, squishing it even more with a binder is often not useful. So that's why understand your classification, understand the mechanism, the x-ray, and then in trauma, you can always, always do the right decision based on that. And remember how to put the binder. Now we have the T pods like this, put it on the GT. Um, so that's it. So it is a life-threatening injury because of the venous bleeding. There's a lot of, lot of blood that can fit in the pelvis.
understand if it's a motorcycle crash with the, often they hit the gas tank and then this it splits the pelvis like an open book or if it's a t-bone in, in, in a car crash and then lateral compression and don't forget the urogenital exam uh, oftentimes in the excitement the foley went in and then the foley in the pelvis and the urethral injury we have a patient on the floor right now uh, that has this so just check the prostate check if there's bleeding on the meatus um all good stuff but for me don't test for me don't test the pelvis uh, you want to you want to cheat me so are you not even touching the pelvis in any trauma patient i'm touching it for pain so let's see let's say i have this x-ray we see there's si joint widening on the left but let's say it was more subtle than that i would palpate the si joint i'll just go in the back touch if there's a if there's pain there it gives me a hint that there's ligamentous injury in the back the front you can touch if you want, but you saw in the x-ray, the guy has an APC type of injury. So you're just touching for nothing. But I'm not testing stability. Personally, I don't. Because I, I don't know what to do with the info. You know, Although in the OR, in the OR, when we do a reduction of the pelvis, when we're reducing that, and if we have time, I'll show your case we did, uh, we, do, we do it. We put the pins and then we manipulate the pelvis. We close on the pelvis. If it's really unstable, we'll see the SI joint. And that gives us, gives us a clue if we need to stabilize the, the posterior elements, but not in trauma bay. But again, uh, that's us. I mean, if the textbook says it, probably you should say, say it in the exam. I have a question for you, Julien. What's your point? Uh, what's, a, what's your stand on the pelvic uh, binders? Like, should we treat the pelvis like we treat the C-spine? And just as soon as you have some sort of a mechanism, just wrap it until you see the x-ray and then you can unwrap it? Or yeah, I don't like, think it, I don't think it's what's the damage in the meantime, like in the lapse of time that, that goes if you don't wrap the pelvis? I don't think um, I don't think there's a big downside. There's some literature saying that if you have an LC two or three, and you squish it even more, you could cause some bladder injury with the bone spike. I'm I'm pointing right now in the pu in the pubic rami. But let's say if somebody comes in, is crashing, it's not doing well, it's it's fine. You can put the binder and remove it once you see. But I just want you to recognize that once you see it is an LC type, uh, then uh, remove the binder. Or once you see it's more of an open book and then you didn't adjust it complete with the binder, now adjust it. You know what I mean? I just, I, it's good to understand what's going on rather than just doing reflexes. Although reflexes are very useful and that's why ATLS is so uh, popular and, and uh, successful. So you can put it, but just reassess for multiple reasons. For, for one, if the fracture needs it. And second of all, if there's other injuries, Let's say there was a, when there's a binder, often you'll forget the urogenital exam after because the patient is binding and you'll be afraid to remove it. Uh, so yeah, these are all points to consider, but I think it's fine as a protocol to think of it, have it ready on the stretcher, patient transferred to the ambulance on the stretcher with the binder. And you don't need the teapot, right? I just want you to remember, you can use just bed sheets and Kelly clamps and that's it. Um, Julian, maybe a, a bit more basic question, but you mentioned the prostate, uh when you're checking the urethral injury. My understanding now, we didn't do it as much as a trauma bay, and um, it's not very accurate. It's not more recommended anymore, but uh, as you are the expert, you guys still use it. You find it useful. I agree. I think if you do a DRE, you can, you, you, you can feel, but for me, it would mostly be uh, blood at the knees. Uh, that's a high yield uh, finding or, or hematuria. But I agree, it's, it's, I think I diagnosed one that had a high riding prostate, that's it, in four years. So uh, I would tell you it's low yield, but you can still do part of it, mostly because of the penetrating rectal injury from the bone. That's, that's important though. Perfect, thanks. Nancy. For the lateral type uh, fracture, are you saying that a pelvic binder could be uh, a negative thing to put? Like, could we harm the patient by putting it? I just want to, like, of course, if the patient is in tra the trauma bay, there's a sign of shock. You don't have your x-ray, right? You're going to put your, your pelvic binder. Once you see there is a lateral type of uh, lateral compression fracture, you would remove it or can we harm the patient by, would, by leaving it off? So I think that will be mostly ortho doing it. So going back to the question, I think, yes, as your protocol uh, check if there's a pelvic ring injury, the patient's not doing well, put the binder on, and then we'll reassess given the stability of the fracture. 
Um, and in terms of arms, uh, there's like I said in literature, some people saying that in lateral compression type, if you over tighten an already crushed ring, you could damage the urogenital structures. But this is more on this, uh, uh, theory, you know, it's not, uh, I've never seen it. I think it's not a mistake to put the binder and then reassess once the patient is stable. Okay, super, merci. And if the patient yeah, has a binder, and it's still not doing well, his tachycard is in shock. Now it's the moment you think, okay, maybe this time is one of the 10 to 20% situation that you have an actual arterial bleed and not a venous bleed. So this is when you need to reassess the patient, involve a general surgery trauma, IR, and the usual algorithm at that point. Questions? Okay, almost there, doing good. Another important injury, so femur fracture, uh, who said that? I think it was, I don't remember who said it, but what would be high yield questions or information for femur fracture? Just nature of the, like, what was the history of the trauma, but then if it's like an expanding hematoma, if there's signs of compartment syndrome, um, severe pain, um, signs of shock, mm -hmm. we think I'd be looking for, um, x-ray signs that you would get on a portable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also look for other injuries. Often if it's a dashboard, you have to look for your classic dashboard injury. If it's a polytrauma, you don't break a femur with a minimal trauma. Uh, yes, you can get geriatric femur or whatever. The real femur fracture in a young person, look for other injuries. Because like I told you, it's a big trauma and there's stuff hiding behind that. So often look for the femoral neck, look from the knee. And there's a high, high... Uh, ratio of or incidence of, of knee instability or ligamentous injury that you miss after a femur fracture but that's more us in the OR and then for femur and then basic principle like I told you if it doesn't look like a limb make it look like a limb you know if he's all crooked with the I once had like a then the guy from another hospital with the, the leg like upside down like this for like a this old transfer you know so no, ma no matter what the fracture is it won't do any arm putting it straight I think about the sciatic nerve being stretched. Think about the the profunda, uh, you know, all the all the, the femoral vessels being stretched. Like this, just realign, splint, and then often on our side we'll do a traction pin because we'll often need to wait a bit before the the surgery. So again, ATLS principles, uh, reduce uh, traction pin is for us, and things to rule out often is femoral neck compartment syndrome uh, and knee uh, ligamentous exam. Good, and yes, you're totally right. If you get bilateral femur fractures, patient can be hemodynamically unstable. We can have like 1.5 liters per leg. So it's a lot of blood loss. Cool. And finally, compartment syndrome, uh, high yield questions, infos, I think it was Mustafa, eh? Or whoever said compartment syndrome. What are high, high yield infos or assessment? Uh, yeah, this one was me. Um, so uh, the sort of classic findings that you're looking for. So um, pain on passive stretch is kind of your first thing that you're looking for or pain out of proportion. Um, and then the other things like um, all of the P's that you're supposed to remember. So your paresthesia, your pain, your pallor, your pulselessness. It's late if you don't have a pulse, but you should be checking and documenting. Uh, and um, there's some typical kind of areas that, I mean, it can happen anywhere, but there's some like typical areas. So your um, tibia, your forearms, your hands, feet, sort of small compartment areas, femurs, yeah. Very good. Uh, so again, I, I don't know why I, I should have put it, but it's a syndrome again. So it's a clinical picture. It's your exam who's gonna diagnose, who's gonna do the diagnosis. So it is a limb-threatening emergency. Uh, it can cause rhabdomyolysis quite rapidly. In the upper X, you can get Volkmann contractures and terrible complications because of that. And it needs a decompression a fasciotomy. Uh, so a, a bit like neck fash, I prefer being safe than sorry in these cases. It is a clinical diagnosis with pain, uh, a compartment intense. If you get paresthesia, scale, and pulses, I mean, you missed the boat. I think. Uh, we should be on top of it. And now we have new devices developed by one of our staff in Ortho, uh, FDA approved. You'll see us using it. It's a Myo one device. It's a pre pressure monitoring system that gives us continuous pressure monitoring. 
and, and then we insert that on the local aesthetic and, and, and it's linked to a Bluetooth and an app. So it's very useful. Um, and that gives us the pressure that we can assess with either the two criteria. And as you know, the two criteria are either an absolute uh, 30 millimeters of mercury or a delta 30 with the diastolic. So these are, compartment is not well understood. Uh, sometimes you'll get uh, people, a patient with like tense compartment. Oh my God, so much pain. And then you open it and the muscle is all red and pink and healthy and reactive. And then you'll get somebody with a tibial plateau, uh, a bit of pain, and then, but it's still tense. So you'll go in and then the muscle is all black and dead. So it's still, you still got so many surprises with these cases and they're very challenging. And, and the clinical impact is so, uh, it's such a big impact if you miss one that I think we should be on top of it. And I'm sure we're missing some uh, with, again, I think it's a spectrum of hyperperfusion of the muscle, but at least if you're aware and you reassess the fractures, like you said, Audrey, that are high risk, like tibia, uh, like a tibial shaft, uh, bold bone form, these are the ones you need to be aware. Um, so yeah, and know your compartments and the stretch test. I'm glad you said it, the stretch test. There's multiple stretch tests. Don't often I, I ask the junior, okay, what's your stretch test? And they say, oh, I did the big toe extension. But there's like 10 stretch tests. You stretch all the compartments of, of, of the zone of injury. So know your anatomy, know your compartment and stretch the actual compartment you're testing and document it for sure for your colleague or yourself when you come back and reassess. Questions on the compartment? Uh, I was curious, um, when I was doing MSK block, there was, uh, I can't remember the name of the ortho, uh, the ortho doctor, but he had guided uh, people in the periphery, like, in just, like on how to do this, like over the phone, if they had a patient where it was just gonna take them way too long to actually get to an orthopedic center. So, um, so it's nice to know that that's possible, but then is there a way that you would prep the patient? So let's say you, you've guided someone to, to do this and then they're gonna send the patient, but it's gonna take them 10 hours to get to Montreal. Um, is, there, is there something else that you need to do for transport? I'm glad you asked. This is one of my, during COVID, I personally uh, instructed a family doc in piverny on the clear forearm compartment. And then he wanted to transfer the patient. I remember he, 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 I was really impressed by this family, this, uh, this doctor. And then we said, listen, guy, buddy, it's a, it's a compartment. We need to do the decompression. And he did that ghetto setup with a blood pressure cough, uh, like 50 cc's of local. And he did an actual uh, single fasci uh, fasciotomy because it was clearly the flexor, mechan the flexor compartment of the forearm. And he did it and, and we published it uh in a journal of telemedicine or whatever but seriously that was my coolest case of the covid year whatever because anyway so we, yes we can do it and i think it's not uh so exceptional it's just you need to have you're saving the guy's leg if you don't do it and you transfer the patient and it's and it was during the winter and it did take 12 hours like you said to come from pv in an airplane so you are uh, saving his limb so local uh backup tourniquet yes for sure get the video conference eventually you'll, you'll get some vr lenses and i'll be we'll be able to you know help you out in remote areas and guide you with the same vr lens and we'll be able to do that but definitely don't if it's a confirmed compartment transferring i think is a mistake and and it's you again you won't do any arm you're just helping the patient so i remember last time he did like a 20 centimeter i can send you the paper if you want the uh, 20 centimeter uh, uh, fasciotomy on the ul flexor ulnar aspect of the forearm down to the fascia open the fascia and that's it let it breathe wrap it up and he was very cool he had like that portable cautery and he actually i think he was starting to like it you know after the stress went down he was like feeling it and then he started to cauterize the little bleeders and he really he did a great job wrapped it up uh, with like back uh, wet gauze ace bandage airplane and that's it he came and then plastic surgery completed the compartment release they did an ulnar nerve neurolysis and then the patient was fine so very nice case so you can definitely do it awesome yeah 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 cool any other questions i think we're done with this yeah so in conclusion there's around top 10 diagnoses that in msk you should be really uh on top of it with these top three things you need to know you need to know them i think you're in business 
uh, stay systematic, reassess the patient. Ortho is always happy to help. Uh, even sometimes when you are, we're busy, but we will come down and we'll help you with the reductions. And MSK is fun. If you understand MSK, the, the, like the biomechanics, the way the bone is displaced, what structure is injured, uh, fixing it is very easy. So that's very good. Any questions, guys? Thank you so much for this talk, Julie. That was great. I think everybody really loved it and it was really interactive. Thank you so much. That's cool. I mean, uh, if you guys want, I have like two cases to wrap up. If I don't know at what time are you guys finishing usually, otherwise. Uh, Unfortunately, yeah, we need to, we need to um, move on, but, but no I, you're welcome to come back. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, no, this is, this is super. Like this is you get fantastic. you get a lot of bring him back from the audience. That's always good. <laughs> and we speak for everyone. Yeah. Any, anytime. Uh, I think I love to collaborate with you guys. You guys do an amazing job. Uh, we're in a really busy center. It's like uh, it's crazy the amount of ortho cases we get here. So I think if the more we collaborate, the more we'll be you know on the same page, and you'll be calling us, and you'll be telling you, okay, I have this case. Is that? Asia, whatever, B at level T8, you know, it's going to be just better. So as, whenever we can do collaboration, I'm more than happy to help. We will keep that in great. mind and act on that. So okay. thank you so much. That was, this is great. Ciao. Feel free, feel free to stick around if you want. Okay. <laughs> I think right. you'll go to the OR. Yeah, that's, that also These makes things sense. about yeah. surgeon. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense too. All right. Thanks, Julianne. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Alrighty, well, that was awesome. So uh, moving on, um, we are going to go to another fantastic presenter, uh, Dr. Laurie, um, who's gonna give us a presentation on e thoracics. So welcome. I don't have too much pressure, right? After Julien, geez. Uh, tons of pressure actually, but it's fine, you know. Laurie, yes. are you in your garage? That's I'm in the garage because people are doing stuff in my home and it's like noisy, so I had to- you were doing, I thought you were doing ortho surgery it just looks like an ortho room in there. So yeah, today I'm giving you a, a training session. We're going to do Zumba. <laughs> I'm kidding. I drink too much coffee, people. We're going to talk about ultrasound. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, I hope Julien is looking for a job, to be honest, because he's uh, welcome to come to the Jewish. Such a nice guy. And Oops. he's a great resident and is great with patients. To have seen him go, he's absolutely great. Oh, no, I have to authorize Zoom to share my screen. Ah. Uh oh. Okay, I don't know how to do this. It looks like Zoom doesn't want me to share. No, I think when that happens, uh, you have, there's, uh, you have a setting where you can do it, but you have to Zoom and you come Okay, back in two seconds. Well, that was a massive um, letdown. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, too guys, bad. While, while we have a, like a minute while Laurie is setting that up, would you have an interest if ever, I don't, I don't know if that's possible, if, but if we approach Julien and have some reduction, like rare joint reduction technique, either atelier or PowerPoint or presentation in any setting? Is that something you'd be interested? Like elbow, um, I'm gonna say it, that thing, that knee <laughs> or hips? Yes. They're gone. There also was, a, I remember when I was like on MSK block, that particular orthopod that I was talking about, he actually had some expensive, uh, compartment syndrome model because the, he's part of the military so he gets extra funds like to do tutorials and training sessions with medics and uh it was literally like it, it was an arm that had all the compartments that um you could open up which it'd be cool if we could get access to one of those from our ortho friends um and practice fasciotomies and such but anyway and Harmin, yes, I saw your comment. Definitely. I don't want to steal away from your session. If you want to ask Julien as well to come in, then I'm yeah, sure he but, will. Uh, but I uh, mean, that's a, that's a fantastic idea. And you should probably do that. It might save you time too. <laughs> um, let's still wait for Lori. 
should we give each other like should we give uh, up until 9 10 and people can go grab coffee and uh, have a bit of a break or oh, we can uh we just have to um We're you, like we'll have a schedule still that we need to hold on to. Mm -hmm. uh, Lori, Lori, Lori's back. Okay. So we'll see if she figured it out. I don't know if it worked. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm going to need some. Lori, if, if not, do you want to send me the presentation and I can be your. Uh... Yeah, right now. Okay, so I'll log in from my computer and out of uh, Zoom. I'll be right back from the. Uh... The thing is, it's, yeah, it's, uh, my God. You know, that's the problem with Max, right? You buy a new computer and then it's just. Oh, it's a new computer. Yeah, because the mm. other one was too slow. Too slow for ultrasound. And I guess it's the first time we present on Zoom. Uh... Okay. Otherwise, anyone in the uh, assistance? Uh, Mustafa, no, that's not related. How do I get it to function? Sometimes uh, it's Dr. Coombs here. I have a Mac, and sometimes it only works with Chrome and not with Safari. So if yeah, you go into Zoom using Chrome, it, sometimes it'll work. Okay. Because I'm in the, the application, so in theory, Lori, if you are in the application, you're trying to share the screen, sometimes Mac will block you. So you need to go to your security settings and allow it to con uh, connect. But usually it tells you that it tells you you have to go to the security settings. So I don't know if this is the problem or not. It will tell you the Mac. My Mac is not intelligent. <laughs> no, it's because it's, it doesn't give me the possibility to uh... I'm gonna to have to Google it. So, so what happens when you when you press share screen? What happens? So I'm done loading it now. Um, Lori, you can go to setting and then you can go to privacy and security. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can go to privacy. Um, then you will enable Zoom. You could exactly. find the application somewhere. I think like camera, microphone, and then uh, enable Zoom. Okay, that works. That works. In 30 seconds, it should be downloaded in my computer. Um, are you able to get it? Yeah, but that's it. It's like it's shaded, so I, I, I can't. So it's sitting in your computer. Oh, and then security and privacy. Here. Okay. Do you, can you guys see Laurie's presentation here? Yep. I don't know. San Sophie, you're uh, going to be giving the talk. No, I'm going to be listening to you. Uh, if only I was not dumb and I could just lecture. put it in full presentation mode. Just do lecture. Lecture. OK. OK. So let's do this. Sorry about this. So um, this is a very basic talk. Um, the first part of this year, as we were discussing earlier, we want to just go back to basics. And now we're going to build on this and try to come up with some um, um, more advanced lectures, OK? At any time, if you have questions, just um, pop something in a chat or um, activate your mic. Um, oh, yeah, you have to switch. Uh, switch again. OK, so I, we're going to just talk about three indications why you should get your probe for um, thoracic focus. 
briefly again describe what type of probe you should select in the technique, identify some normal and abnormal findings, and then I want us to go through some little cases. Uh, you can move it, Sophie. Thank you. So the first one we're going to be talking about is pneumothorax. And um, focus for pneumothorax, why should we get it? Well, honestly, every patient you think um, presents with dyspnea, some chest pain, even if it looks atypical to you, you'll be surprised the number of time you'll catch something um, with your probe as maybe the etiology of the chest pain or just a simple pneumothorax because we know it happens. Definitely in the context of trauma, you should definitely get your probe. But also as part of, you know, we talked about the RUSH algorithm or the EGLS algorithm. This is important. Um, this is the last one we usually look at, but don't forget about it. It's actually um, something that you can do a, a critical intervention and possibly save a life. Um, you can switch. The probe of choice here, it's very important. Okay, I see a lot of people using the curvilinear probe for um, uh, pneumothorax evaluation, especially in the setting of trauma. Don't do that mistake, okay? It happens so often that people take that probe and then they say, well, there's no pneumothorax. It's so difficult, right? That little subtle um, lung sliding you're appreciating is always best appreciated with a linear probe that has a higher frequency, uh, more resolution. It's just gonna give you a clear answer when with the curvilinear probe, you might be hesitating and you wanna do it quick, right? Your EFAS in the context of a real trauma. So select the right probe and the right probe is the linear probe. Uh, we can move. Good, so where do we do? Don't forget to position your patient appropriately. Very important, right? They need to be lying flat. Your probe's gonna be longitudinal, the marker is cephalon always, it's a convention. And start at the most anterior aspect of the chest wall. And usually that's gonna be like the third intercostal space. Um, and make sure that you do a few of the intercostal space. So one above, one below. And I'm gonna just do a word of caution here. This is the approach you're gonna be using in, the pro and the, um, in an EFAS in a trauma patient. Why? It's because you assume that they're young, that you wanna do a quick survey to see if you're putting in a chest tube, yes or no. You're not doing this if you suspect that the patient comes in with the pneumothorax. If the patient comes in, sudden onset, pleuritic chest pain in a tall, thin man who's a smoker, you might want to do a bit more than the um, anterior interspace, like one above, one below. You might want to do a bit of lateral and a little bit, um, a little bit lower on the chest wall. Um, that um, I can send you an article about this. Some people have tried to see maybe we could expand a little bit the number of intercostal space we do, but I would say keep that for the non-traumatic pneumothorax. In the context of a pneumothorax, you can still hold this, but make sure that they're supine because you want to catch the most anterior part of the chest wall. And then you realize I'm moving my hands and my camera is not even activated. Okay. Um, okay, what's your area of interest? Your area of interest, again, remember, rib, rib, and pleura. This is what you're looking for. And you can also think about, uh, you can move, and Sophie. The bat sign. Yes, I had to put Batman somewhere. You're going to see there's going to be a kitten picture very soon. So, um, oh, go back. So the bat sign is important. You want to be able to appreciate this. So always make sure you have a rib, a rib, and the plural line. Very good. So what are we looking at exactly? Our normal lung will always have some lung sliding or comet tail artifacts, and a lung pulse. And we'll talk about it later. We talked about it a little bit earlier this year, but I want to just do a reminder because it's something that sometimes we get confused about. Good. So that's what we see with the normal lung. This is a normal lung. Again, always make the exercise that you want to see two ribs on your view. Here we see one rib, another rib, and here you can see the plural line below the rib, right? Not now. Now you see the ribs that have a dense shadow behind. And here we have ribs where you can see the plural line underneath. Does anybody know why you see the plural line below those ribs? Because you're at the cartilage uh, junction. Exactly. Next so to the sternum. See. Very good. So you might be a little bit too close to the sternum. So make sure that you're really the midclavicular line and not too close to the sternum. Excellent. So this is very nice lung sliding, right? And maybe some little comet tails. Good. So that's a normal lung. We can switch. Okay, what are we looking for for pneumothorax? So for pneumothorax, what we're looking at is that there's absence of lung sliding, there's absence of comet tails, and there's no lung pulse. And for you to be able to say, okay, this is indeed a pneumothorax, you absolutely need to identify a lung point, okay? Otherwise, it could be many other things. Good. Let's 
move. So that's a pneumothorax. Again, bad sign. Rib, rib, pleural line. Once you identify this, this is your area of interest. Look at the pleural line. And here we can appreciate, and then I don't think I can, um, if you put your cursor on the video, Anne Sophie, you can play it back. Oop. That's okay, we'll, we'll keep that one. Good, so that's also an example of a pneumothorax. So you can, yeah, there we go. Here you can appreciate, again, rib, rib, right? You can uh, identify them with your mouse maybe, Anne Sophie. Yeah, rib number one, rib number two. And where's your plural line? Yes, this is your plural line. This is the white thick line that's there. Don't get fooled about the line above, right? It's always gonna be a little bit below the ribs. And you can see the plural line is not moving. Yeah, there's no shimmering, there's no sliding, there's no comet tails. You do see movements though, so don't get fooled. That movement are the intercostal muscles above trying to breathe. The guy is trying to, or the girl is trying to take a big breath and it's definitely not working, okay? So important, always make sure to identify your area of interest. Very good. Okay, this is an example. So you suspect that there's a pneumothorax because there was none of the criteria we talked about, but you couldn't appreciate a lung point. Here you do though, right? You see that nice shimmering that abruptly stops right below that rib. And that is a confirmation that there's indeed a pneumothorax. This is a lung point. Very good. We can switch lung point. Okay, pitfalls. The absence of lung sliding does not always equal a pneumothorax. Can you guys tell me why you would have absent lung sliding on, a, on the uh, intercostal space you're assessing? Right main stem. Yeah, right main stem. Patient is um, having severe asthma, severe COPD, or not taking the enough deep breath. Yeah, so there's no air going in. Or like you paralyze your patient and you're not bagging, you won't see anything. You might see comet tails actually, but you're not going to see lung sliding. What else? What if I tell you the guy is uh, 95 years old? They might have a, either a bleb or a, a pleuradhesis uh, procedure or previous pneumothorax. Exactly. And I think Arthur said pleural adhesions, definitely pleurodesis, a previous pneumothorax, a previous trauma in the area. Um, remember that. Um, well, that's it. You, there's so many things that can cause this. Um, there's no air going in. Just be careful and always make sure you look for these other signs. The other signs. The other thing is always beware of physiologic lung points. And as part of the as part of the algorithm we're teaching now, when we evaluate for pneumothorax, we always tell people try to find the lung points. Okay, just to make sure that, that you're not you know you're not getting calling a pneumothorax and putting a chest tomb in something that is actually um, not a definitive lung point. It's more like a physiologic one. And we can go to the next video and that's a nice illustration of this. This is a physiologic lung point, beautiful lung sliding, comet tails and boom, this is a beating heart, right? Um, this is not a normal lung point. And if you can play the video again, what you're gonna see, oh, whoa, go back. Okay, good. You're gonna see that the pleural line and that pericardium, they're not on the same level, right? So usually when you have a, a pneumothorax lung point, they're really gonna be on the same level, on the same line, not a step lower down like in this case, or when you see the diaphragm on the right side and you're looking at the liver point. Beautiful example. Good, so my tips and tricks, make sure you use the linear probe. I'm never gonna insist enough on this one. It's very important. Put the probe perpendicular to the pleural line. It's really gonna optimize your view. You know, when I, uh, when I talk to you about anisotropy, when you do MSK and you're a little bit tilted, your probe is not perfectly perpendicular to the pleural line. It's a bit the same um, type of artifact. It's really gonna get you a nice crisp pleural line if you're completely straight with it. And always make sure you decrease the gain and the depth. You want to have your best assessment possible because every time you don't put um, those adjustments and you can go to the next slide. Yes, a kitten dies. <laughs> so you want to make sure you don't put too much depth or too much gain when you assess for the pleural line. Oh, this is so cute. Okay, you can move to the next. Very good. So now that we clear that, and we're very comfortable now uh, assessing for pneumothorax. Let's talk about pleural effusion, which is often, you know, we don't talk about, uh, about it much, but it's still very important. So we can uh, go to the next slide. 
super important in your assessment of dyspnea patient, uh, anyone comes comes in with uh, atypical chest pain, uh, and again, in the context of trauma, and also as part of your rush protocol, hypotension, and usually I'm going to include it in the rush protocol. When I do my fast, I'm just going to go a little bit above, and then I can have access to the uh, pleural space. Excellent. The probe of choice here, uh, yeah, not the linear one, right? Because we want to go a little bit deeper. Uh, it's often going to be, as I was explaining, part of the rush where we're going to be assessing the right upper quadrant. So you want to have something that will have enough penetration um, and, and enough depth so you can assess the presence of that pleural effusion. So curvilinear probe is your probe to go. Again, make sure that your patient is lying flat. It's really going to help you um, get a better assessment when you're doing that type of uh, uh, um, positioning or probe, uh, probe positioning. So you want to put your probe longitudinal, your marker again is going to be looking cephalid, and you're going to start at the mid to posterior axillary line at the, the uh, level of the xiphoid. Um, this is usually where you start for your um, fast. However, remember the fast, you're usually going to start at the mid axillary line on the right and the posterior axillary line on the left. Um, so very similar um, location. Uh, make sure your patient is supine. And what are we looking at? What's your area of interest and we can move? Yeah, area of interest is the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is separating your liver or spleen from your lung. The other thing that you always want to identify in here, um, I can, uh, Sophie might be able to just um, whoop, go back to the other side, identify it with your cursor, is the spine. So at the bottom of the screen, um, so bring your mouse down the screen. For some reason, my computer doesn't want to show the... Oh, that's okay. Just go back the... to the left. It's okay. Go back okay, to the so... okay. People can... Uh, uh, my lecture. mouse, okay, my mouse is literally not working, so lecture. Good, that's okay then. Um, so at the bottom of the screen, you're going to see there's a, like a white ragged appearance. That's that's your spine, right? And you can see that it abruptly start, uh, stops at the diaphragm level. Every time you do a scan for pleural effusion, do that exercise. It's important. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is an example, again, of your area of interest where you have your kidney. Uh, let's say this is your liver, for example, your diaphragm, that is that thick echogenic white line, and the spine that stops, yeah, at the bottom of the screen, right at the level of the diaphragm. It doesn't go in the thorax, okay? And that's important again. Very good. So we can move to the next video. That's normal lung. So that's a video showing a normal lung where you're going to have your kidney, your spleen in this case, because it's tiny, tiny, your diaphragm your spine that stops and that doesn't go further. And then that classic curtain sign, right? Where your patient takes a deep inspiration and then the lung is gonna come and really hide your all interface or almost in this case. This is a classic curtain sign. We can move to the next video. A pleural effusion is easy. You're gonna be appreciating a spine sign. So you can move to the next video. Okay, this is a great example. So similar patient, actually it's uh, pretty much the same video, as, but it was just the other side for the patient where you have again, your kidney, your liver, and you have your spine down there. And all of a sudden, again, do that exit. You're like, hey, my spine is going in my chest. So my spine is extending above the diaphragm. This is because there's something creating an acoustic window for you to see that spine. And that typically is going to be fluid. And here we can appreciate the black is fluid and we have the atelectatic lung floating and getting probably a little bit of the heartbeat causing the um, lung to move in that fluid. So this is a spine sign. This confirms that you do have fluid or pleural fusion right there. Just as an aside, this was a, a case I had in Chicago. It was an esophageal perforation, a sword swallower. Yeah. I'll always remember that case forever. Like 2014, see that? I was still a resident. Oh, okay. Next slide, please. Okay, this is more impressive, okay? So maybe you want to just play. Yeah, thank you so much, Anne-Sophie. This is another example. And here you can see, well, Lori, your scan is suboptimal. And why is that? So where's your spine? Well, we don't see the spine, yeah, the, the, you know, I don't have enough depth. This is the case where the kitten dies because you didn't have enough depth. So here you really want to increase your depth to have a look at 
your landmark. I want to see my diaphragm all the way down. I want to see my interface. I want to be able to appreciate my spine. But I'm telling you, let's say the spine is right below the screen, at the bottom of the screen, sorry. And what you appreciate here is, again, your diaphragm, that thick white line below their solid organ. And above, there's a lot of black. And then what you see again is atelectetic lung. And here's the best example, I think, ever of a baby elephant. This is called the baby elephant sign. So if you click on the uh, side of the video, right next to it, and come back. Yeah, baby elephant sign. It's because it was hidden by the play bar. <laughs> yeah, so this, is, this, is, this just signifies that this is a more impressive effusion than the previous one because you have more atelectasis of the lung. Very good. We can switch. Okay, pitfalls here. Make, make sure that you don't mistake it and say that there's no pleural effusion uh, when you are uh, facing a complex effusion or a consolidation because they can really mimic those mirror image. Okay, let's have a look at an example. So normally what you have, you're gonna be having your spine, your interface, your, your diaphragm, and then a nice curtain sign, because sometimes what you see on the other side of the diaphragm is like a mirror image, right? It looks like there's something, but when the patient takes a deep breath, it goes away. That just confirms that there was indeed a mirror image. The diaphragm is so reflective that it gives you mirror images all the time. I'm sure you remember that from the basic course we've had. Here's an example of, uh, well, good, of probably, um, what do you think is going on here? What can be causing the image we see here? Could there be a, with clots? Yeah, very good. So it could be an emothorax with clots because it, does it look like pitch black? No, right? Looks like it's gray. And, and then I, I, I'm telling you, my image is good. I didn't overgain it. Well, maybe a little bit, but it's not, it's not the gain. It's not the gain. It, there's really something going on in there. So if you can appreciate, we're good, there's a diaphragm. And right below, there's going to be the spleen. Yeah, diaphragm, spleen right below. And you know, okay, there's something above my diaphragm. And it looks like there might be an effusion, but it's a weird effusion. And then, you yes, I think somebody said the, yeah, somebody said the right answer in the chat. Um, this is a complex effusion. This is an empyema, actually. So the, bl the black gray that you're seeing is the effusion, but a complex effusion. So an effusion with pus. And what you see in that, Sophie, you can maybe point at it. There's like, yeah, it doesn't look like a baby elephant anymore. It doesn't look collapsed. It looks like the lung is still there. And now it's full of those almost bee lines extending there, right? There's white spots and lines that are extending. This is a perfect example of dynamic air bronchograms. So when you inhale, when air is moving in a lung full of pus, you're gonna see those artifacts. So this is an amazing example of a pneumonia with dynamic air bronchograms and an empyema. So you know right away that this patient, okay, you might not just be giving a little azitro and send home. This patient is gonna need um, some more aggressive intervention likely. Okay, can you see um, empyemas or complex pearl effusions with just normal pneumonias? I'm telling you that yes. So POCUS is so good. It's so good at picking up very small amount of fluid that this might not actually need decortication or anything. But I'll be honest, in this patient, it was actually a very complex pneumonia. Um, it's just that keep in mind that when you see a complex effusion like this, a bad consolidation or impressive consolidation like this, uh, you know, the patient might need a CT at one point to perhaps confirm that there's an empyema, let's say they're not responding to antibiotics or partially responding to it. So extremely interesting, but don't, um, um, don't be um, fooled by this and saying that, no, oh, you know what, there's no pleural effusion. It's actually quite complex. Okay, we can move to the next. Okay, we're moving to cases. So um, anybody can answer. 18-year-old woman with shortness of breath for 48 hours. Okay, you can move to the next. Pneumothorax at this center space, yes or no? Yes, no pneumothorax. Good. What do you see? I see the shimmer, uh, shimmering and uh, coma tails. Beautiful. Excellent. Well done. Okay. We don't know what she has. Next patient. Okay. Now you have a 90-year-old male with shortness of breath for 48 hours. 
Let's have a look at that scan. Okay. There's a minimal pleural effusion. Okay. Agreed. A tiny spine. Possible. There's, I can't. This seems hyper reflecting here. Is there a lesion or either an infection or lung cancer somewhere? Yeah. What if I tell you the guy's been having cough and fever for like a week? <laughs> right? Yeah, so that could be a pneumonia. So it's likely a pneumonia with a tiny effusion. And again, that doesn't mean that this guy has an empyema. It's a tiny thing. It looks like it's pits black, the associated effusion. But you're very suspicious of a pneumonia here. Nicely done. Next. Oh, no, another one short of breath for 48 hours. But this time he's 50 years old. Let's have a look at the video. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, he really is short of breath. Like tachypneic and like recess type of shortness of breath. There's a lot of beelines in this one. Yeah, very also, good. Hydrogenic, hydrogenic shock could be in my differential. Yeah, and, and um, uh, agreed. Cardiogenic shock could be it. Let's say the guy is hypotensive. What if I tell you his blood pressure is like 250 systolic? Pulmonary edema. Yeah, so these uh, high, um, um, hypertensive emergency, right? Hypertensive... Uh, um, induced pulmonary edema. And this is the type of patient that's going to respond very well to your nitroglycerin, BiPAP, and it's going to look like a rose within 30 minutes of you doing all of this, right? Um, anything that I could optimize maybe with, the, with my probe here? I don't think we need that much depth mm -hmm. here with the, yeah. for, the, for those lines. What type of probe did I use? Very linear. Yeah, the only thing that um, uh, you have to be careful is whenever you're looking for B lines, it's always best to take a curvilinear probe. Here, I'm not assessing long sliding, right? I'm assessing for a different type of artifact. We didn't really touch about it because I'm sure Joel's going to do a presentation about it at one point for the evaluation of the dysnic patient. But B lines are best assessed with the curvilinear probe because you really want to have enough depth, usually all the way down to 18 centimeter. Here, I'm at 13, but it's pretty clear in that video. Beautiful. Well done. Oh, no, another one who's short of breath for 30, uh, 48 hours, 32 years old this time. Hmm. Yeah. Is it? Can you 100% say, OK, this is pneumothorax? Plus, I'm not 100, pneumothorax. but I can say that there's no, there is no um, plural mo movement here. But there you're, might be something else going on. So what are you going to be looking for if you're trying to confirm that there's indeed a pneumothorax? go to other spaces, find my clear long point where it is and uh, scan the, the look if there's another cause. So escalian pneumonia or see other things. Beautiful. So this is likely a pneumothorax. Let's uh, move. And yes, so as you're moving down, you realize that there's a long point. Yay. So you diagnose a pneumothorax and you go and insert a pigtail. Next slide, please. Okay, 44-year-old who you just intubated for a septic shock, super, super sick, hypoxic rest failure, um, sat is 70%. What do you see here? That's the right chest. Lung standing, yes or no? Yes. Good, next. You're going left chest. Oh. But there's lung, lung pulse. Yeah, so you can move to the next slide. Don't get fooled, right? This is not a situation for chest tube. Next slide. Remember, we were talking about the lung pulse, right? For pneumothorax. Um, how do you assess for this? So quick reminder, because my Mac's going to run on the battery. You can move next. The lung pulse is the transmission of the cardiac motion to the lung parenchyma. If you have this, you rule out a pneumothorax. Next slide. What if you're not sure? If you're not sure, get the M mode there and look for those cardiac pulsations at the level of the pleural line. And here you can appreciate the pleural line is that thick white line and you do have cardiac pulsations. Next slide. Remember that you have a barcode sign. So your pleural line is gonna stay still like a barcode if ever you have a pneumothorax. So there's no lung pulse. Next slide. And a seashore sign is typically the normal lung, where you're going to have a bit of lung pulse, but also some shimmering. So it looks like a seashore. Very good. And the lung pulse again, cardiac pulsation. So it's like a hybrid between barcode and seashore. Good. 
So if you have no lungs lining, you have no comet tails, but you do have a lung pulse, you just have a non-ventilated lung. Either your right main stem intubation, you have an airway obstruction, your tube is full of secretion, or your patient is not being ventilated, like someone mentioned earlier. Excellent. 72-year-old female with shortness of breath for 48 hours. Yeah. Hemothorax? Yeah, it could be a hemothorax. Could because be... of the level? Yeah, like well, the it's actually... Depending level. I yeah, think. it's not really a level here. It's uh, this is atelectatic lung, like oh. very atelectatic lung actually. And remember, you have multiple lobes, right? So it doesn't always look just like a big blurb of lung. It could be like separate like this. This is like a massive effusion. So maybe this is cancer related. Maybe this is CHF. Hard to know. I would say CHF. Just looking at the IVC, to be honest. Sorry, okay. but here you oh. had a dynamic air broken grounds, right? Yeah, not nah, yet. So you have to be careful. What we're assessing here is not dynamic air bronchograms. You see very hyper um, reflective lung tissue, but these are not the same that we saw before. It's very subtle and it's not easy to distinguish, but this is this goes more with atelectatic lung. And I don't see air dynamic bronchograms. I just see uh, the lower part of the right above the, um, the diaphragm. Um, this is just hyper reflective, no, a little bit below. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, more to your right. Yeah, this one. This is yeah, hyper, but this is not a dynamic air bronchogram. This is yeah, just yeah. electric tissue. Yeah, I, I could tell now since you said, you said it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thanks. We. Oh, and Monica had a question. Uh, can you comment on the utility of A lines in um, pneumothorax diagnosis? Is that it, Monica? Yeah. Eh? So the. Uh, a lines doesn't help you, unfortunately. So if you have A lines, it doesn't rule in or rule out a pneumothorax. So you have to be super careful. The A lines are just an artifact from a plural line. So if there is a plural line, I want uh, um, not a plural line. It's just an artifact of a linear white line. So you can still have A lines with a pneumothorax, but that doesn't rule it out or rule it in. So I usually forget about that. I don't even look at them. If I see B lines, though, that rules it out, right? Because B lines are in theory like the comet tells. Well, very good. Thank well, you for participating. I have a question on awesome. the A lines. Is the A lines rule out the the, the pulmonary edema? Uh, good question. So pulmonary edema. Remember that it's going to accumulate posterior first, lateral after, and then it's going to move anterior. So depending on how your patient looks and how the, uh, where you're positioning your probe. So someone comes in with satting 50% in horrible rest distress and have no beelines anteriorly. I can pretty much tell you that this is not a flash pulmonary edema or a horrible cardiogenic shock with tons of pulmonary edema. Um, but someone who's a little bit short of breath and I have some focal beelines laterally, uh, it, it could still be uh, pulmonary edema even though there's nothing anteriorly. Okay, so it's going to be a matter of the number that you have, the laterality of them. Uh, but yeah, so the A lines do not completely rule it out. It just depends on what's the location they are at and the uh, clinical correlation. Thank you. Right. I'm going to have to call it there. We've had two wonderful presentations. Thank you so much. We're 20 minutes behind schedule. So uh, we're going to take a very quick, we're going to give you a break, uh, five minutes. Uh, and then um, Adam's been very nice. Uh, Dr. Gossack has been very nice to give us uh, some extra time. And so um, in uh, at 9.45, we will start again. But Lurie, that was awesome. Thanks so much. I think that even the most basic of POCUS presentations still can, there's lots and lots to talk about. So thank you so much, Lurie. My pleasure. Take care, guys. I miss you. Enjoy the uh, whatever you're doing in the garage. <laughs> Listening to you. Perfect. Okay, we'll see everyone in five minutes.
Okay, should we start? Sorry, I think Jake was talking. I didn't hear anything. I don't know if it's in my hands now, but I'll start. I heard you and Sophie. Oh, we're we good to go. No, I don't. Yeah, yeah, I think we're good to go. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for Sorry being about here. That, guys. No, no problem. Sorry, I didn't hear uh, Jake speaking. We're the one who are apologizing. Sure. No, no, it's all good. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Gossack. For those of you who don't know me, I am the Emergency Medicine and Health Informatics Fellow. Um, it's my second time giving you guys a talk. It's uh, very different from, I guess, what you guys are used to hearing about, but you're hopefully getting more and more talks. I know Anthony spoke to you last week, so we're going to continue on another health informatics topic. And today we're going to talk about descriptive analytics and some practical applications in the ED. Um, let's see if I can get my presentation. There we go. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I'll be working at the SHIM in a couple of weeks, so uh, maybe I'll run into some of you, who knows. Um, I, I just want to quickly plug in the um, fellowship. Um, I mentioned it last time as well, and I know Anthony has brought it up as well. Um, I just want you guys to realize that I think you're very fortunate to have this type of a fellowship that's been started, um, especially that it's really geared towards Merge. It's not a lot of places that do, it's starting slowly. But I think you need to realize that you know we are we are interacting with computers and technology every day um, more and more, both in our personal lives but also at work to improve our flow and patient care. And so we can get on board with this and actually be a part of the changes that are being made and then help implement and give you know feedback towards new programs that are going to help us and our patients, or we can sit on the side and let someone else do it and then complain when it's not the way we wanted it. So. I think it's important to get on board and to, you know, try and think about these things and, and, you know, there's electives that are being offered and it's just something to consider because this is, this is where we're going. So the objectives for today, um, we're going to talk about descriptive analytics and what I'd like you to take away from this is the importance of looking at data and making sure that we're dealing with, you know, good data and if, do we have poor quality data, is it accurate. Um, if we want to measure something and create something with the data, well, we need to properly define what we're going to measure. We have to define the metrics. And then we'll look at two practical applications, which reflect um, two projects that I worked on during my fellowship. So I hope you guys will enjoy it. It is interactive. So I'll be asking guys some questions. Feel free to answer and don't be shy. And uh, let's have some fun. So um, this is the data information knowledge wisdom period. Um, Dr. Robert showed this to me in my first lecture just over a year ago. Um, and it's come up a few times since, and here I am bringing it up to you. And it basically what it's saying is that at the bottom of the pyramid, um, you have all of this data that's collected and it's unorganized and it's raw and it, there's, you know, can, there can be mistakes in it. And you can't really, just looking at the data, it's almost impossible to infer anything from it and, and figure something out. And then if you go to a level up, it's here up, you have information where you've cleaned the data, you've organized it, you've put it into some sort of structure, and then you can infer some sort of information and come to a conclusion or answer a question. Um, one level up is knowledge, and so you take information and you create relationships between different pieces of information, and then you can actually get some more higher level material. And then the top one is wisdom, where you're answering questions of, you know, why this and why that and what is better, and you're really, really getting into intelligence and putting the data into this intelligent form that can be used for, for many different reasons. Um, if we talk about analytics, so there's four types. The ones that we're focusing on today is really descriptive, and it really serves to answer the question of what happened or what is happening, uh, and that's what you're using the data for. Um, there's others as well, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. We're going to stick to descriptive for today. Uh, this is a slide that I borrowed from uh, Dr. Roberts' previous presentation, but if you look at, let's say, descriptive analytics in the emergency, you can answer questions like, well, how many patients you know, did we see today? Or how long did a patient wait to see a certain consultant and you know how many were admitted you know so what happened or what is happening and then diagnostic predictive and prescriptive are, are different types of questions as well okay so we're going to stick to descriptive for today um and you have to realize that not too long ago we were you know doing everything on paper um emrs electronic medical records didn't exist or even patient tracking systems didn't exist and so everything was done pen and paper and it was hard to collect the data properly. And if you wanted to actually go and, you know, answer any sort of clinical questions with the data you had, well, you had to go to the archives and you had to pull out all the charts that you needed and you need to, you know, try and collect information and say, well, you know, what time did all our patients arrive? And, and you know, how long did it take for them to see a doctor? And it wasn't the easiest thing to do. Um, it was very tedious. Obviously registries existed and there were certain systems, but it was, it was quite primitive and we've moved a long way from that. And now 
on a regular day, we're interacting with computers, we're charting on computers, everything is going through an electronic system. And so all that data is being recorded and kept somewhere and it can be accessed and leveraged. Um, and, and that's essentially the idea is that what's so cool about this is that you have access to everything at your fingertips. You need to have access and approval, but once you do, you can do anything you want. It, it's infinite. You can access the data and calculate or figure out whatever you want. It's the possibilities are really endless. And I think that's, it's pretty cool. Um, so some key elements to get this going. Well, you need approval, as I said, right? So uh, you need to, you know, you need to know whether it's with the DPS or it's with the department or an ethics board, but, you know, accessing the data is one thing. You have to make sure you have permission, just like people used to do in terms of wanting to do a research study and then go get some charts, the same thing. Um, you need to have the actual access, right? So, um, for example, patients, um, physicians or, or staff that are part of the emergency department can, let's say, see things that are in medjilge, but if they wanted information on, let's say, um, surgical outcomes or ORs, that data can be contained in a completely separate program like Med Echo. And so you might not actually have access to those programs. So it's a matter of getting access to what you need. And then all along the way from start to finish, having specific goals and targets and, and really establishing the scope of your project and saying, well, what is, what am I trying to accomplish? What do I want to find out? What am I trying to measure? So that you stay focused and, and you really target your, your, um, your project. Um, you know, like I said, there's vast amounts of data and you can get lost in it. And so you have to really stay on track. So what to do with all the data, and this is actually a slide I pulled from the last presentation I showed you guys. Um, there's a lot, you, you can really, you, you, you pick your poison, you choose what you want to look at and, and the, the options are there, right? So you can do GA projects and say, you know, how good are we are, you know, how fast are we actually getting antibiotics into septic patients? Or, um, you know, how fast are we to actually get trauma patients to CT, to CT or to the OR? And so you can select these patients and look at them and study the intervals. You can look at department performance or individual performance. Um, you can do QI projects as well and look at different workflows and timings and say, you know, how efficient are we at X, Y, Z, um, you know, different sorts of resource allocations and simulations, or you can do just, you know, basic research and try and answer a clinical question as well. So there's lots, the, like I said, the potential is really there. And that's the message that I'm trying to get across to you guys today. Um, ED dashboard. So let's say we're talking, you know, we're still in the field of descriptive analytics and we're specifically speaking about, let's say, an information page that you can open up and you have this sort of information dashboard in front of you that, again, answers the questions of what happened if it's retrospective data or what is happening right now if it's plugged into live data. Um, and if you probably recognize um, the image on the right, this is a screenshot of kind of that initial screen when you log into Medilge, you see a kind of primitive dashboard. Um, that's been designed that tells you, you know, these are CTAS 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, you know, how many are waiting and I guess what their status is, and then, you know, how many patients have arrived into the emergency department. So, you know, this is all the patients that have arrived by, I guess, 6 p.m. There's, you know, 110 and then, you know, walking in ambulance. Um, and so, you know, you, you what, what question are you interested in answering or what process are you trying to improve? And so you can really choose what you want to see, you know, how many patients are waiting to be seen, how many people are arriving or being discharged on an hourly rate. Um, how many people are admitted but, you know, boarded right now waiting to go upstairs? What are my delays to get my labs or my consultants or my disposition? You, you, you know, pick the question that you want to answer and you can, you can look, use the data to help you. Um, this is a more complex dashboard. This is SA Health, I believe, in Australia. Um, and this you can access just on the internet and it gives, there are a network of hospitals. And so I look at this dashboard and I say, okay, so this hospital is called LMH. There are four expected arrivals. There are 10 patients waiting to be seen, 43 that have started treatment and so on and so forth. And here's the actual wait time. And so here you have all the different hospitals in their network and for each one. And so someone whose role is let's say to manage the different hospitals and look at flow well right away, very quickly looking at this summarized dashboard page, they can see you know, what's the status of each hospital. Um, you can break it down by triage categories and say, okay, you know, category one, two, three, four, how many patients are waiting to, waiting to be seen um, and so on and so forth. You can break it down by, you know, pathology or the type of case, mental health, pediatrics. And so it really gives you the numbers and it summarizes it in a way that's meaningful to you. Um, so this is just one example of a dashboard that can be created using data. And in this case, it would be live data. So, you know, it's, it's great to make these dashboards, but the, the first step is to take the data and say, do I have good data? Um, is the data accurate? And can I use it to answer the questions that I'm trying to find out? So we're gonna go over, and this is kind of an exercise and I, I hopefully get some answers from you guys throughout. So you can just think about um, 
when you're spending a day in the emergency department and interacting with the uh, computer and the, the, the programs and, and doing actions, how it has an impact on, on, uh, on the data. So let's say we want to answer three questions. So how many patients are placed on stretchers versus sent to the waiting room after initial triage, right? So you want to, let's say there are two patient populations in the emergency department, those that are horizontal and those that are vertical, and they're, they can be quite different. And let's say you want to study them separately. So you have to be able to distinguish these two people, these two groups. Um, another question is, what's the delay to prise en charge? And I'll be using you know, the term PEC from, for the rest of the presentation um, between patients for a single position. So Dr. A pecks a patient, he sees them, and then how long before he pecks another patient? And then how long before he pecks another patient? So you want to see what's the time interval between pecs, if that's something that you want to measure. And the third thing you might want to know is, you know, in the department, how many patients are admitted versus discharged each day, okay? And these can be used to help you in different, different avenues. So if we look at the first one, stretcher versus waiting room patients, um, this is a screenshot from the triage screen that your triage nurse sees in Medellin. And so they fill out all the patient information, the vitals, they choose what the complaint is. And here, if you see a circle, there's a field called destination after triage. And so the nurse will choose and say, you know, I think this patient can go to the waiting room or I think they can go on a stretcher. You know, this is where I want them to go. And so my question to you, and you can feel free to answer is, can we use this? Can I say, well, great, I need to distinguish if a patient is waiting room or stretcher, and I'm just gonna use this field. So I'm gonna take, you know, I have the big data table and I'm gonna take the column called destination after triage and say, oh, look, this guy's on a stretcher. Each row is a patient, by the way. So this patient got put on a stretcher, this one went to the waiting room, this one went to the waiting room. Is that, is it as simple as that? Any thoughts as to yes or no? And if I'm asking you, maybe there's a... I'm assuming no, if you're asking. <laughs> there you go. So, so here, let, let me give you a, a a bit of an explanation to that. So I'm going to show you the same table, but I've let's say I've opened up more data columns for you to see. Okay, so we have the same column here called destination after triage. And then I have a column here that tells you when the patient was put on a stretcher. So when the unit clerk said patient Smith is going to stretcher five and they assign stretcher five, that time gets put into the system and it's recorded and we can see that in the data. And the same thing, when you as a resident or when a physician wants to see a patient, they double click on the patient's name. And when your name appears, that's the PEC timestamp. And that also gets recorded. So if we look at some of these and we see, okay, for this first patient, their destination was a stretcher. They were put on a stretcher at 3 p.m. And they were PEC. They were seen by the doctor at 3.30 p.m. Does that make sense? Yes, to me, it makes sense. Okay, they got put on a stretcher and then they got seen by a doctor. I have another patient who was assigned to the waiting room. They were put on a stretcher at 4.30 and they were seen by the doctor at five. And they go, okay, well, if you were sent to the waiting room, how did you get put on a stretcher before you saw the doctor? You know, there's something here doesn't seem to make sense. This patient here was sent to the waiting room. During their whole visit, they never got put on a stretcher and they saw a doctor, that makes sense too. You can go to the waiting room, you see a physician, you never see a stretcher, you go home. Uh, you have a patient here who was supposed to be sent to the, stre to the stretcher side never got put on a stretcher, but did see a physician. Saying, well, that, that seems a little fishy. Um, so I won't go through all of these, but you start looking at the data and you're saying, well, none of these don't all make sense, right? Does anyone know why that might be the case? Because we're not that good to actually put in the info and the data. Well, so it's, it's automatic, right? Like the nurse chooses where yeah. they think the patient should go and they go. And so when you look at the data, this is just kind of saying what I showed you already is that you have some stretcher patients who are never actually assigned a stretcher like this one, or you have some that are assigned a stretcher after um, they see a doctor, right? So like this guy here saw a doctor at six and was put on a stretcher at 7.05. And then you have some patients in the waiting room who are actually assigned a stretcher before they get to see the doctor. Um, so it, whether it's that we're not good at putting in the info, but it's that if you think clinically what happens in the emergency department, you know, things, things can change, things can happen, and so you have to account for them. So I'll give you an example. The triage nurse says a patient should go on a stretcher, but there's no stretchers available. And the patient doesn't look so bad. And, you know, you know what, sir, why don't you have a seat in the waiting room? I'm going to see what I can do. We'll get a stretcher available. You know, a patient doesn't look so bad. There's still no stretchers available. Oh, and Dr. A is working in uh, vertical and he's really fast and so we'll put you next to the room and so they end up going to the waiting room getting in an exam room seeing the position and they get their prise en charge and so they've been set, sent to the stretcher side by triage but they've actually gone to the waiting room and they've seen a doctor and so you say well were they really a stretcher patient or were they a waiting room patient 
Um, you can have patients who are sent to the waiting room, they deteriorate, you know, they pass out, they vomit, they're keeling over in a pain. And so they actually get put on a stretcher and then brought to the stretcher side before they see a doctor. And so their status changes. Um, you can have unofficial protocols where let's say, um, you know, it's, it's understood at triage that anybody with chest pain has to have an EKG done, which is the case. And so they say, well, while you're waiting for your EKG, because it takes so long to set it up and get the machine, we're going to have you go wait here. I need to close the triage. So we're going to click that you're going to a stretcher. Um, that's what we do consistently for all chest pain patients. And then you'll get your EKG. And once we look at the EKG and the doctor signs off, then we'll decide where you go. And so half of them end up going to stretchers and half of them end up going to the waiting room. And so the, the initial choice of everybody with chest pain who needs an EKG goes to stretcher is not actually true. Or you can have a user error, okay? So then the question is, well, how should you actually distinguish the two groups in our data, okay? And so if you think of another definition, it's, well, you're in my, in my eyes, you are a stretcher patient if you are put on a stretcher before seeing the doctor and you're a waiting room patient if you never get put on a stretcher and you see a doctor or if you get put on a stretcher after you've seen a doctor, right? We can see patients on the walk-in side um, work them up. Oh, he's kind of sick. Let's get him on a stretcher. That's fine. But he's been seen initially through the, that waiting room uh, method. And so it's just a matter of comparing those timestamps that I told you about, right? So what time were, did they see a doctor? What time when they put on a stretcher? And you create used logic and you create a conditional statement. You say, if this, then that. Okay. So if we look at our table again, you can create a new, you know, this is where you work with the data. And so this is the data you have, which you say there's some problems with it. So I'm going to create a new field, a new column, and I'm going to call it, let's say, actual destination after triage. And you compare the timestamps and you end up creating the list that, that you need. And so you say, this guy who was sent to the waiting room was actually put on a stretcher before seeing the doctor. And so he's actually a stretcher. And you say, you know, this time is before this time. So he's a stretcher. Um, and so you, this creates the data that you're then going to use. And this is how you can distinguish the two groups. Okay. I know it's, we're a bit out from uh, talking about compartment syndrome and, and, and lung sliding, but it's, you know, this is an interesting way to work with the data. Um, if we want to talk about delays, the cuisine challenge. So let's say we're looking at physicians and how they, they, they see patients. So we have Dr. A and he has one minute delays between patient please on challenges. And you're like, oh my God, that's super fast. This guy's like the flash. It takes him one minute see another doc, you know, between patients. Does anyone know what could explain that? He you know, clicks on, just, on it too, just, too yeah, fast just, and he's not actually seeing the patient right away. Let's say I have 10 patients that right away within, within five minutes, there's 10 patients that have been pecked by the same doctor. Just rapid okay. clicking. Sign over, right? Think about it. When you start a shift, you have to sign over all the patients in the section. Let's say you're doing a horizontal shift or, you know. Um, and so every time that doctor takes over a new patient, they click on the name and usually each sign over for each patient takes 30 seconds, 45 seconds, a minute, two minutes. And so at the start of every shift, you have this period where there's a whole bunch of texts that are being done quickly. Um, and, and so you have to be aware of that. It's not about him seeing patients super quickly. It's just the workflow in the ED. And what's great is that Mandelj actually does differentiate between the types of pecs. And so it'll know if you're the first doctor that a patient is seeing, it'll know if you're the last doctor, or it'll know if you are on neither of those two. Um, and so you have to leverage that and use that when you're analyzing your data and saying, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm not interested in sign over, so I'm going to ignore um, certain types of pecs when I'm studying that data. Um, let's say you have Dr. B who, and this is what I think, uh, uh, Sophie, you were referring to earlier, you have a simultaneous peck of three patients in five seconds. And you're like, okay, whoa, this guy can clone himself and see three patients at the same time. Um, and so I, you know, the idea of whether he clicks on all three at the same time, or if he's working with a student or a resident. Um, and so the question is, is it, is it really that it's I'm with another person while well, you go see them and I'll go see this person. So, you know, at the bottom of at the end of the day, it's the staff's name that gets put on the patient that gets put in the data. So whether it's the resident or the student seeing them, it goes to the staff. Or it's due to user behavior, which I think is what you were getting at, which is the doctor clicks on two or three patients at once, um, but obviously can't physically see them at the same time, right? And so um, this is due to user behavior and it can be difficult to control. We can tell users, you know, the rule is you can't click on more than one patient at once because then the data is not accurate. And it does impact the data quality, right? Pa the third patient is not gonna be seen at the time of the first or the second patient. Um, and let's say you wanna say, how fast are we to evaluate CTAS-1 patients in recess? You know, the sickest of the sickest, how quick are we, okay? 
And you look at the data and you look at the timestamps and you, of when the patient arrived and you compare it to when the doctor clicked on our name and you say, oh my gosh, we are really slow. There are much longer delays for the doctor to actually pick the CTAS-1 patient than CTAS-2 patients. Any idea why that could be the case? Think about when you see a patient in recess and then you actually... Because we go into a room before opening the computer. Yeah, so the patient comes in, let's say cardiac arrest comes in, you're not sitting at your computer waiting for their, their, their thing to pop up on the screen to click on them. You're going in the room, you're treating the patient, you're stabilizing the patient, you're working the code. And 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, an hour later, you come out of the room, you do prescriptions and you realize, oh, I haven't even clicked on the patient yet. So you click on it. So it's not accurate data, right? So like exactly what you said, the, the, the PEC is done after the patient's actually seen, right? And so if you look at these three situations, you say, well, what can we do about this? So for the first situation for Dr. A, um, it's really just a matter of accounting for the different types of PECs when you're analyzing your data, being aware that you, know, you might have a situation like this due to sign over, which is nobody's fault. Uh, for Dr. B, you can say, well, either we changed user behavior if that's where we wanna go, or we accept a certain degree of inaccuracy. And then for the CTAS-1 patients, either you find a way to improve the, cur the current processes and workflow so that the PEC gets done right away, you have to figure out a way to do that, or you accept a degree of inaccuracy and you say, we don't even look at the delayed of these shells for CTAS-1 patients because we know that it's not accurate. If you look at, let's say, admission versus discharge, so that question of how many patients are admitted or discharged in a day. So I'm telling you that there's a field, there's a column within the data called orientation. And so it tells you if the patient is admitting, return home, left without being seen, transfer or death. And so the question is, can we use this field to say, oh, well, look, I'm going to count how many are admitted and I'm going to count how many return home. And if I'm asking you, it's because the answer is no. Um, and so if you look at the data further, you see that a large number, and it can depend, but a significant number of patients who were discharged also have a timestamp for when a consulting service requested an admission. And I go, okay, why do I have so many people who went home, but yet cardiology or neurology or internal medicine actually requested an admission? Any idea of why that would be the case? I'll tell you. Um, and I'll give you a hint actually is, are, do you think we're actually capturing all the patients who were admitted? So the answer is no. Um, think about this. If you have, you know, if, if the beds are full on the floor and a patient can't leave the emergency to go up to the ward, they can be admitted by the, by the consulting service and they can actually stay in the emergency department for several days if it's, you know, if it's really bad. And so their admission happens while they're in the emergency department and they can get better pretty quickly. And so they can actually leave, their admission can end, start end to end in the emergency department. And so these patients, when they get better and the consulting service signs off and says, okay, you're good to go home, your admission is over, their orientation is gonna be return home, not admitting, okay? And so you realize that admitting really gets reserved for those who get actually sent up to the ward. Um, versus those that go home. And so those that go home can be actually discharged or, you know, admission complete. So what do we do about this? Well, we create a new column like we did for that previous stretcher waiting room situation. And we say, okay, well, if the orientation is admitting, it means that the patient actually was admitted. They went out to the floor. So we're very happy. So our field is going to be the same thing. It's going to be admitting or admitted. If the orientation is returned home, hold on a second. We need to make sure that the patient you know, were they really discharged from the emergency or did they have an admission? And so you go and you check the timestamp for admission and you say, did anybody request an admission for this patient? And if the answer is yes, you say, well, you know what, they were admitted, but they just stayed in the ED because it was so slow to get them up to the ward versus there is no timestamp. And so they really were discharged. And this will be, this will determine whether, you know, how many patients were actually admitted versus discharged. Um, we're gonna move on to defining metrics. So def a metric is a measure, right? It's usually a quantitative assessment and it's just, you know, choosing to measure something. So something really simple. I wanna know what is the ED length of stay for a patient? And so my question to you is, well, what is the appropriate start and end times to use to calculate this? And if you look, there's actually numerous ones that you can choose from. So I don't know if you know, but if when a patient physically walks into the emergency department, they aren't triaged, instantaneously. And sometimes you can have multiple patients waiting to be seen at triage. And so not all, but some departments have a ticket system. So you press the button, a ticket comes out with a time on it. And when you finally do get to triage, 
the nurse will scan the barcode on that. And so that ticket timestamp of when you actually arrive gets put in your chart into your system. So do you use that ticket as the timestamp? Do you use the episode creation? So if you end up at registration before triage and the registration physically opens your electronic chart, is that the timestamp you use? Do you use the start of triage or you say, no, 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 no. It doesn't really count that you're in the emergency until triage has ended because you might not actually stay if triage says, you know what, you're not sick and you can go somewhere else. So which timestamp do you use? And then for the end time as well, when does the episode end? Is it when the doctor clicks in Medios and says this patient will be returning home with a follow-up or, or you know, no follow-up? Um, for patients who are admitted, is it as soon as the consulting group says we are admitting because now it's an admission episode? Or is it when the, phys the, the actual Medios visit is closed, when the unit clerk goes in and actually removes the patient from the list? So I'm not giving you the answer to that because it depends on what you're looking at. Um, but just be aware that it's not as simple as saying, well, ED length of stay is this. It depends on what is your start time that you're choosing and what is the end time that you're choosing, okay? Um, how many CT scans does each physician order? That's a question that, that lots of people have asked before. Um, and so the question is, well, does one CT requisition equal one CT scan? And so what I say, you know, I'll bring up a couple examples. A CT for a stroke, how many CTs is that? Is that one? Or do you count the C minus as one, the C plus with the contrast? Is that two, three? Who knows? A pan scan, do you count that as one? Or is that a chest, abdo, pelvis, so that's three? Um, Dr. A, who orders a CT head and a CTC spine for a patient who fell and also has neck pain. Or Dr. B or Dr. C, who order CT heads, but also order you know, facial bones or orbits. So kind of a different window of the, of the same scan. Right, and I, you know, and then it's a question of, well, were these ordered all at the same time? Was the CT head and CT orbit ordered together? Which might change your answer versus if I tell you, well, you know what, he ordered the CT head and four hours later he ordered the orbits. So it, again, if you wanna calculate it, it sounds simple. How many, you know, how many scans did you do? But when you actually go and look at the data, you need to figure out, well, how am I calculating this? Am I, am I grouping certain ones together? Are they separate? So it's not as simple as you think. And the last one we can talk about is, um, how long it takes, let's say for a patient who sees a single doctor from start to finish, you're on, you're in the waiting room, you see a doctor, they work you up and that same doctor sends you home. Let's say you wanna know how long it takes for the, that whole process to take place. Um, one to say, okay, well, what type of PECs am I, do I need to include or exclude in the analysis? So we want, like I said, single physicians. So you're only looking at patients that have a single prise en charge and that allows you to filter out your data and exclude anyone who saw more than one doctor. And then, you know, I had a bonus question here, but we can just go over it. Essentially, the question is, do you need to exclude patients who were admitted? Because my question talked about discharge patients. And the answer is not really, because we're only looking at single prise en charge. And anyone who's admitted is going to have at least one more prise en charge by the consulting service. Um, and again, the question is about what is your start time and your end time, right? So the start time is from the moment the doctor, you know, started seeing you did your PEC. And the end time you know, when does the episode end? Um, probably the one that's most accurate is when the disposition decision is made. So when the doctor says, okay, I have all my labs, I'm gonna send the patient home. I click return home in a medirge, there's a timestamp for that. Um, and that's probably the most accurate one that you can use. I'll just speed up because I know time's going by. Um, the last point before I show you just some of the dashboards. Um, once you've defined your metrics, you just have to make sure that you're comparing things properly. So if I were to ask you, do you expect the number of new patients seen in a shift to, to change uh, depending on the type of shift you do? So how many patients you see in an H2 shift versus an ambulatory shift? Does that change? Oh, Probably. It changes. Yeah. So would it also depend on the day of the week, Monday versus Sunday? Or yeah, the time of day? Yeah, available to be. Yeah. Two in the morning versus two in the afternoon. Very different, right? So if you're going to start comparing things you need to you need to make sure you're comparing the same you know using the same uh the same situation and these are the these are the ones that are straightforward to to account for right these are pretty straightforward to to factor in but then you have ones that are harder right so a staff working with a med student on their first day in the emerge versus a pgy5 who's doing their last shift of the residency we agree that there's probably going to be a different number of patients that are seen um, by each one and so that that impacts performance um, you're ready to see patients, but there's nobody in the waiting room versus there's a full waiting room that will impact how many patients you see. Um, you can't see patients if you're doing the stretcher side, if there's no stretchers available for patients to sit on. And then there's other ones here that are hard to account for, but nursing shortages, lab issues, IT issues, computers don't work. Um, it's going to be hard to account for those things to compare. And so you, at some point you have to say, you know what, everyone's going to be exposed to some of these less measurable issues during their time in the ED. And so that'll kind of wash it. 
Um, and the bottom line is basically make sure you compare, you know, oranges to oranges and apples to apples um, if you want to really get a good comparison. Um, so Power BI, um, this is a program that's used. You guys can download it for free. And actually with your McGill email addresses, um, you can get kind of more pro access to it. Um, those of you interested, I think it's worth looking into and it allows you to basically create visual dashboards and connect to different databases. So it's pretty cool. And it's what I use in the, um, for my projects. Um, and just quickly, I'll show you in about three minutes, um, a couple of dashboards that I did. So if you look at, let's say a department level dashboard and metric, um, this is one that I created all the data, most of all the real data has been taken out. Um, I can't show you guys real data. And basically any numbers you see here are, are fake. I just put them in last night. I erased everything and put in stuff. So it's all made up data. But if you look at a department, uh, you can see, let's say, okay, for the year. So from January to December of 2019, how many patients of each CTAS did we see uh, in each month? And you can actually, I can't click on it now. I can only show you screenshots, but if you click on each month, you can actually break it down to the day. And you can say, you know what? I only wanna look at patients arriving on weekdays or weekends. And so you can check or uncheck all these boxes and really filter down your data to answer a specific question. You know, How many CTAS twos did we see who arrived on a weekend who ended up going home? You know, You can really tailor all this. And it's dynamic. You click on it and the data changes in one second. Um, you're not generating reports. It's not static, it's dynamic. And these numbers as well will change as you play with your different filters that you have access to. So the daily visits, how many patients leave without being seen, how many are admitted, the ambulances that you're getting. And then you can, again, you can answer different questions, questions about your department. How many visits are we getting on a monthly basis? And you can follow the trends or you can do it day of the week. And you can see, you know, there's a lot of patients coming in on Mondays less as the week goes on it bumps up a bit on friday then it drops down drastically on the weekend and so if your department is looking at let's say adding a physician um to help with some of the you know the large volumes say well probably we'd start during the week and we don't necessarily need an extra physician on a weekend because the data is showing us that the you know the volumes drop and again you can play with the filters here um another thing that you might want to measure in your department is you know how many patients are on stretchers and waiting for the doctor to see them and so you can measure that data. And, and this curve actually is similar to the one that you saw with the Mendel dashboard I showed you earlier. Um, but as the time of day, so the x-axis is your time of day, as the day goes on, the number of patients waiting on a stretcher gets higher and higher and it peaks around three or four. And most people who have been in the ED long enough can tell you this just from experience. Oh yeah, you know, it, it usually gets pretty busy around uh, shift change. And that you can actually prove and show looking at the data. And then you can calculate different things. You know, how many, what was the max number of patients that were waiting or how many times were there over five patients waiting? And so you can choose what you want to calculate and you can show it and you can play with it as well. And if you look at waiting room, this is a similar exercise for patients in the waiting room. So the peak of patients in the waiting room is right again, around shift change, three, four o'clock. Um, and so you can calculate anything you want and you can play with the data. And so this is something that you can look at dynamically. And this here right now is clearly retrospective data, right? Because it's in the past, but you can hook this up with, live data and pull it straight out of Medill and and see you know right now how is how is my waiting room looking um so these are a lot of different department metrics that you can look at and it's not an exhaustive list you choose what you want to study you take the data and you you can create one to answer these questions and lastly if you want to look at more of an individual level and then i'll be done um you know if you want to look at physicians and how they perform or if, you know me as a physician i want to know how i'm doing so i can log into my own personal dashboard uh, it'll have my name up here. Uh, just to let you guys know, all the numbers here are fake numbers that I put in. Um, I've cropped out some of the images, so it looks a little funny, but I can't show you real data. Um, I say, okay, so I'm logging in. I work, you know, I this is I work at the hospital, and so, you know, let's say for my vertical evening shifts, how many new patients do I see per hour? So I see on average 2.3 new patients per hour. The group sees about 1.8. This is my percentile. This is the number of shifts that I did that were vertical evenings, and the group did about this much. Um, you can see an overall performance for all your shift types. I've cropped out the ones here and see how do I do compared to the group. Um, and then you can even get kind of an idea of your, your velocity. You know, during your shift, if you break it down for each hour, what was your hourly average of new patients seen? And you can see, was I really fast at the beginning of the shift and then I slowed down? Um, you know, how do I compare? And you can compare that with the rest of the group as well. Um, and then what's great here at the bottom is that you can, each, each bar re represents a different position. It's all anonymous, so you can't see anyone else's data. And it says, where do I fit in with the rest of the group and with the average? Um, 
if it's you, it'll be in a different color and it'll show you which one is you and where you fit. And it's all anonymous. And then you can just kind of look at the data and say, well, you know, is the data normally distributed or is it really skewed? And so you create this frequency distribution and say, well, I'm here. The mean is here. These are like one standard deviation. And so you kind of see where you fit into everything. And, and so you can create this. And this is just, it's for the physician to log in and look at it and say, oh, okay, this is how I did. This is, you know, how fast I am or how slow I am. Or, you know, I do better on vertical evenings than I do on H2s or H1s. And you can repeat this for a number of different processes. So very quickly for the number of consultations that you see, you can say, well, what are the outcomes? Um, you know, the light blues means I consulted a service and that service admitted the patient. The dark blue means I consulted a service, but another service admitted the patient. And orange means I consulted a service and nobody admitted the patient and the patient actually went home. And you can say, well, you know, are my consults appropriate? Or are they not appropriate? And obviously there's a lot of questions that go into it and who's the consultant and how it goes, but you can get a rough idea and you compare yourself to poop and say, you know, for my ICU consults, you know, I have, a, you know, over half or just about half are actually admitted by ICU. That's pretty good. And the group looks about this. So you can compare. Um, you can break it down to a specific, you know, if you really want to drill down to more details, you can choose a consulting service, see how many consults you did and see how you fit in with the respect to the rest of the group. Um, another one here is, let's say, unplanned return visits, right? So I see, I see a bunch of patients, I send them home, I want to know how many actually come back, because it's hard for you to capture this. And you can look at this at 72 hours, you can look at it at seven days, you choose the interval that you want. Um, and so you can see what your percentage is and you can compare it to the group and you can say, well, you know what, for all the patients that came back within 72 hours, how many had a higher acuity C test level than when I saw them and how many had the same or lower? Or you can say how many of those returns um, were discharged on their return visit or how many were admitted. And so this can just give you a bit more information on these patients, which you wouldn't otherwise know about. Um, you can, there's options to exclude certain ones. Um, and, and this is all just taking the data manipulating it to create calculations to create these metrics that you want to measure. Um, there's a couple more here about, you know, how many new patients that you see that you actually send home versus sign over. Um, and there's some as well in terms of, you know, how long it takes you to do the PEC and then send the patient home. How long are you with the patient um, before they leave? So these are just different department metrics that you can look at. There's for CTs as well to see how you do, how many CTs you're doing, what type of CTs you're doing and compare it to the group. Um, and, and so it's really just a matter of, of taking the data and manipulating it and creating a visual that can answer the question for you. So key points to my last slide. Um, again, descriptive analytics, it's really there to answer what happened or what's happening. Um, it's important to set clear goals for what you want to measure and determine your target audience. Is this for the department admin? Is this for the individual physician? Is this for nurses? Um, as you saw, it's important to properly define the metrics that you're going to be using. You know, what is my start time? What is my end time? What is the stretch of patient? What is a waiting room patient? Um, the quality checks are important, as I showed you, right? So this idea of does the orientation return home mean that the patient was not admitted? And the answer is no. Um, and then you can go ahead and create meaningful reports and dashboards that your users can use and play with and, and infer uh, information from. So I know that was pretty quick and, and different, but hopefully uh, you took something away from that. If you have any questions, I'm happy to, happy to answer. It's awesome, Adam. Thanks so much. Um... Like, uh, unfortunately, due to time constraints, we're like we're gonna encourage people to uh, to put their questions on the on the sidebar in the chat. But that's awesome. Like, just with the data points and how there are sub data points, and sub data points on sub data points that you can analyze. It's it's pretty cool and super interesting. And um, that's awesome that you're getting so involved in it. And um, hopefully, I'll be able to get to a journal club again at some point soon. <laughs> but thanks. But please stick around because there are questions for you. I believe on the side. No problem. I'll be around. So, no problem. okay. All right. So without further ado. Uh, Dr. Sophie Gosselin, um, go right ahead. <laughs> you can get started. Hi. I'm going to chat on the side because I know that things are pretty active and I will be uh, sharing my screen to share my presentation. So um, Lars asked me to come and talk to you about systematic reviews and how to stay organized. Um, so we're going to try to do this quick because unfortunately I've got to leave in, in half an hour um, sharp. Um, everything okay for the shared screen? That's great. Okay. All right. So mandatory disclosures. 
Uh, I don't have any affiliated pharmaceutical company. I've just been recently recruited, though, as a consultant to Synchrony Medical Communication, which is not pharma, but it's an outfit that produces systematic reviews and guidelines for uh, the drugs and toxicity guidelines for North America. And um, for those who know who um, don't know uh, me, I'm a co-chair of the Extra Report Group. I'm a medical toxicologist uh, and uh, emergency physician. And I think so far we've published, um, I say over 20, maybe 22, 23 um, systematic reviews and, and guidelines. So I will be coming to talk to you today about um, experience on how to can do systematic review. What are the things that you uh, need to think about? So at the end of this presentation, I hope that you'll be able to outline the steps to conduct a systematic review. And uh, we'll quiz you at the chat, in the chat. There's three tools to make your job easier and also list two common pitfalls uh, that you have to think about and try to avoid when you're uh, preparing a systematic review. So I understand that systematic review is something that is, um, appealing to do because there's no prospective data collection or so it seems, right? But what you're collecting is not necessarily data collecting for patient as chart, but you're collecting uh, a, a lot of articles. So um, there's standards. Uh, you can look at the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Review. You can look at the Prisma statement on how to be very transparent about the type of article that you suggest. And if you are reporting a systematic review, you will be expected to produce a, a study selection workflow diagram to, um, to account for every citation, every study that you looked for, that you've excluded and that you've kept. Um, you can also look at the National Academy of Science and the AMSTAR checklist is actually the, um, the standard to decide if your systematic review has been done properly. So I suggest right away to avoid a pitfall when you're already very uh, in the middle of your systematic review that you plan to incorporate the AMSTAR checklist and that you check the AMSTAR checklist beforehand because if you ever hope to publish your systematic review, this one is the, this checklist is going to be used to decide whether or not you've reported anything or if you've done anything the right way. So the first pitfall to avoid is to embark on a systematic review and not knowing what are the criterias that your systematic review will be evaluated by. So always check that and try to build it in into your protocol. You can look at the Institute of Medicine that says that anybody that wants to do any form of guideline, it has to be supported by a systematic review. And that came from a document uh, in, two in 2011 uh, standards for systematic review. So that's another uh, interesting document you can check. And you can also have the AMSTAR checklist here where you see the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute um, is, has been a part of. So all of these are uh, available online. They also update regularly. So before you embark on a systematic review, try to see if there are new things that have come up and use the latest version of these uh, criterias. So it seems um, that you'll never be planning your systematic review enough, right? So it's like writing a protocol. Um, avoid to the, the temptation to uh, start collecting article and asking, going to your librarian and saying, okay, I know you've had a talk um, by a librarian a couple of weeks ago about how they can be useful. So I'm not gonna go into what I think they've discussed uh, with, with you, the, the, the tools and how to do the mesh term and the people, because I think that's been done before. I think on September, September 22, there was a librarian that came and talked to you. Okay, yeah. I saw it into the, I saw it into the, the recap, which was very useful. Uh, so first you need to have a team with appropriate expertise. Don't try to do this by yourself because it's really a lot of work. So if only just to share the burden with somebody else, um, it's also going to be useful. And you'll also need more than two people to decide which article you keep and which article you not keep. So don't embark on this alone. You'll need people to manage bias and the conflict of interest. Um, if you want to do a, a systematic review, think of the end user and all of the stakeholder and try to have their input. If you're trying to do a systematic review um, on a particular treatment, try to think ahead of time, well, who are gonna be your reader? Who are you doing this for? You're, you, obviously you're doing not, you're not gonna embark on all of this work um, 
just for your own personal satisfaction, you hope it's going to be useful for other people. So try to plan and to think what would they like to see? How is what data would be helpful for them? And this is where I invite you to talk ahead of time with other people and to say, if I'm doing the systematic review to tell us, you know, where we are at with, you know, this and this, uh, you know, treatment or, or condition or whatnot, what would you like to know? What variable are important to you? So we did this something with that, something that you haven't seen yet, but it's been in the planning on how to measure and assess the QT in overdose. So we've talked to various people, we've talked to cardiologists, and, and a lot of people said, well, you know, measuring the QT is important, but knowing the potassium and knowing the magnesium is also important. So we made sure that we extracted that data. You don't want to come in to the end and realize that all of the data that you've extracted in the hundred articles that you've read, you forgot to extract the potassium level and see if it was there. So try to plan that ahead of time. Pick the topic of the review, design your question, your PICO, develop a protocol, and ask other people to look at your protocol. Um, you can submit it on Prospero, you can do a lot of things, but it doesn't necessarily require a um, ethics registration because you're not having to do with any patient charts or not. But I encourage to have people look at, um, at your protocol so that they can give you uh, their opinion on whether or not you're, you're, you're missing something. When you find and assess the study, well, you have some differences between a comprehensive review, a scoping review, a systematic review, and I don't know if that's been addressed yet, but I've got a couple of slides at the end to uh, discuss you the differences between the two. Today, we're going to focus on the systematic review. You have to look for unpublished studies. You have to screen and select each other's study, but you also have to document your search. So once you've decided what your PICO will be, your MESH term assisted with the librarian, then they're gonna give you a big download of citations. And you're going to have to screen um, those citations to see which one uh, is interesting or not. Sometimes you'll see there's a lot of different things that are caught in the net and you'll have to screen. And then you have to account for each of these citations. So you have to account for the duplicates. You have to account for the citation that were completely irrelevant because somehow they got captured in the search, but they had nothing to do with your topic. You have to manage all your data collection, your uh, full text article. And after you've decided, okay, these are gonna be the articles that I've decided to keep and to, to extract or to look for the full text. Well, you're gonna have to appraise each study to look for their bias and their evidence um, to see if you can trust the data. So more uh, specifically, let's see, is that a double? Finding and assessing study, synthesize the body of evidence. Uh, you'll have to use uh, some form of assessment for each outcome. You can use grade, you can use other, but you have to be um, transparent about why. Uh, if you want to do some quantitative, this is when you can do a meta-analysis, I suggest that you, you, you uh, you, you recruit a trained methodologist um, to do this with you. Uh, when you're synthesizing the body of evidence, right, uh, there's always a risk of um, heterogeneity of all of your study and uh, looking at statistical uncertainty. So unless you're trained in doing this, I suggest you delegate that task to somebody who's doing this for a living. When you have to look at your report, uh, make sure that you're planning a little bit ahead of what's going to be your title, what's going to go into the abstract, what are going to be an executive summary, and also if you're thinking uh, of something of interest for other people, a lay people summary, and what is excessively important is the transparency of your study selection process, why did you exclude certain studies, how were they appraised, and you can use ample use of tables and figure and all of your data extraction, um, you can put into a supplementing material because otherwise it's not gonna be a very readable article if people see tables and tables. So make sure you put that into the supplementary material, but try to select the key topics based on what your stakeholders or your end user would wanna know and make tables and figure for the summary of data. Strength and limitation, gaps in evidence, funding source. And then you should try to reassess this every two to four years, which nobody does really, because after you've done a systematic review, um, if it's to inform a guideline, 
then technically you have to reappraise them every three to four years. But for a systematic review, it's not so mandatory. But if you want to do it, then you can think of reusing the same search strategy and going with all of the steps uh, that you've done before. So this is the Prisma statement that you need uh, to use. You have the Prisma checklist and the Prisma flow diagram. You can download it. You can uh, use it to make sure that your work in transparent and all studies are accounted for. So this is what it looks like. First, you've got your identification. You've got your screening. You've got your eligibility. And then you decide which studies you want to include or not. You have to do duplicates remove, how many records or citations um, excluded. Why did you exclude the uh, full text article? Either it was um, it was the wrong article attached to the wrong citation. Uh, it was not the topic discussed. Uh, if you're looking for a certain treatment, intravenous treatment, you could exclude it because uh, this was a rectal administration. If you're looking for dialysis, you could decide to exclude peritoneal dialysis. If you're looking for acute overdose dialysis, you could say, I, I will exclude these one because they were chronic patient on peritoneal dialysis, so not at all the same population. Um, you can say also that you could never found the full text or it was a language that nobody spoke and that you couldn't get translated. You know, all sorts of reasons. You've got to put them in there as well. Um, then this is where I suggest that you use a reference uh, manager software to help you uh, navigate and collect all this evidence. I can't imagine the people doing this, you know, before uh, electronic uh, tools. Um, and uh, this is where the EndNote or any other citation management software, I just use EndNote because McGill Library um, provides it for free. And that's the one I've, uh, I've gone to use and know because there's lots of tutorial online that you can, that you can do. So I, that's the one I use, but I, um, there's others, there's Zotero, there's Mendeley, uh, there's Paper. So just, just pick one that you know and that you like, and that's gonna be, that's gonna be uh, really good already. Then you have to look at the qualitative synthesis and the quantitative. So you can use all your table, your, uh, your figures and your executive summary. This is where this comes in. When you're doing this, the, the study selection, and the citation selection, uh, first you have to do, I inverted these two slides. So this, the citation selection, you can use EndNote Web. So everybody share the, the citation selection, but you have to make sure you look at your criteria a priori. You can say, okay, we're gonna exclude everything that's in vitro. We're gonna exclude everything that's done in animal. We're gonna exclude everything that's not an intravenous or all other administration, whatever is your topic but you have to decide that ahead of time. And then you can do this as a group to exclude the citation. And another one that's very, very user-friendly is called Covidence. Uh, Ryan is another one that's free at McGill, but I happen to use Covidence because I work with somebody from uh, John Hopkins and, and Baltimore and he had Covidence. And so since he was in charge of that aspect of the, of the, the database, uh, <laughs> We, did, we, we decided to use what the, what the tool that he had. And what's nice is that they sometimes come on a, on a little app. And so you get this app on your phone with the citation and you can swipe left to exclude. It's like, you know, some of the dating app, I think not, you know, that you just swipe left, swipe right. So you include, exclude, and then you have the criteria on top. So you're waiting at the bus, you're waiting in the Metro, you're waiting for something. You can have a time to screen a couple of citations and decide which one you're gonna, not you don't think are relevant by reading the abstract. Um, so if a lot of people do this, this uh, tool will capture the when somebody says to keep and somebody says to to exclude, and then you'll need a third person to adjudicate the discordant decision. So all of this is done automatically, and you don't have to. So it's a little more cumbersome to do in EndNote. And particularly the web version, but uh, with Covidence, it's quite uh, it's quite it's quite uh, easy. And then you go into your Covidence account for the particular project. You can have multiple projects. It's like a Teams, really. And then you have you click on your project, and it it tells you, okay, this is your assigned job. So your assigned job is to screen the conflicts and resolve, either exclude or include. Or your job is to screen, and then you've got like six hundred citations to screen. 
And then it's quite motivating when you see the number come down and then you say, you have no more just green. So all of this is uh, tools that you can use, either Providence or, or Ryan. I don't know Ryan very much, but I know that it's free at McGill. And I think it's, it's similar in the concept. Um, there's others that you'll see uh, online. And once you publish a systematic review and you're the corresponding author, um, they'll probably email you trying to sell you their products uh, like distiller. But this is like, you know, $2,000 per user per month or something. So it's really expensive and it's not needed to embark on, on that. So either Providence or Ryan would be my, my, uh, my choice. Then once you have to do your study selection and you've screened your citation, then EndNote or another software manager is really good because you can input all of your citation into that management software. And then while you're on your VPN from McGill, go find full text, find full text, and then you plug it on at 10 p.m. And in the morning, the, the software has attached a lot of PDF to those citation. And this is how you get your full text. So if you're working uh, with other people internationally, each library has a different sets of articles. So what we usually do is we go in sequence and we do a first pass with one university, then we ship the library to somebody else, they run it through the university, and then so, so on until we only have a very few article to find manually or to request that interlibrary loan. So this is again where the librarian might be useful, but I think lately they're so busy, they're not gonna find the full text for you. So try to pick a software manager that can do it automatically while you're logged on to, um, to your McGill VPN, for example, that'll save you a lot of time. And then if you have a friend you know, at a, at a university, you can ask them to just you know, screen that library through their own library VPN. And oftentimes every library attaches a few more until you're left maybe with only 30 articles to go and, and, and find by yourself or request an interlibrary loan. Again, the document repository, the number one thing you have to remember for a systematic review is that you need to have transparency in all of your steps. You also want to help yourself because I, you know, I suspect not a lot of people has a dedicated research assistant or full-time secretary um to to do this for you you don't want to have multiple versions of the same document i think nowadays with teams and stuff everybody's learned with shared drive but when i started to do systematic review mostly with xtrip in 2010 google sheet and dropbox were just you know um coming on as use you know like the tools that people were using and so there were people in the team who didn't want to use that they were not um uh, used uh, with the Google Sheet, and um, and it takes a lot of time to merge all these documents, right? So if you really want to make your your life a, a little easier, um, you try to work on a shared uh, on a shared document for both your protocol and your manuscript and your table. Um, people will use Dropbox, and this is what I used to do at the beginning but it creates a lot of conflicted copy, even if you're trying to work on at the same time. Uh, I think Teams, I should write Teams now, uh, Teams um, does not create those kind of conflicted copies and Google Drive and Google Sheet have certain limitation for formatting citations. Um, so you can try, you know, using EndNote the site while you write, if you're trying to, to, to write or to keep your references. So just try to, uh, pick something that uh, you and your team are comfortable doing so that there's only one set of document um, somewhere. Uh, full text takes time. If you want to translate, you can use this online doc translator. And the nice things about it is it keeps the format. So sometimes rather than paying, uh, I see sometimes in budgets for research assistant, $5,000 for a translator. Why would you pay $5,000 for translates? put it through the online doc translator and you'll probably see the gist of it as if it's something relevant or not. And then, and then if yes, then send it for professional translation, but not, you can exclude a lot of things based on that. You can try with Google Translate. Sometimes it provides for humorous translation. Um, and then uh, I also urge you to look for other languages than English, uh, namely in the older studies that if you, what you're looking at is, uh, is a recent or a new treatment. There's a debate into should you start uh, to the search since the very beginning of the database 
or do you have to put a timeline? My suggestion is to look when your treatment came on. If it's, a, if it's the use of a medication or if you're looking for a disease that could have happened before, then you'll be surprised with older studies um, in, in, um, uh, in other countries published in their own language before the advent of all electronic communication. You might find some very gems, like some whole gems that you, you weren't expecting. But if you're looking for a treatment, uh, there's are just very, very new, then you can afford to look uh, a little closer and put, put a date that's not necessarily 1955 beginning of PubMed. You have, um, does, is that okay right now? Can you put, do you have any questions so far in the chat? I'm trying to go fast uh, because I've got another meeting at, <laughs> at 11, but. Uh, I think you're being pretty clear so far. I don't see anything in the chat. If I do, I'll let you know. Okay. Uh, so you've got your you've got your PICO, you've got your mesh term, you've had your citation uh, list, you've screened through them, you've decided, okay, these are going to be the full text that I'm interested in reading. Then you're going to have the data extraction. So the data extraction you do on your full text. Uh, either use an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet, do color coding. What I also... Um, recommend for you is uh, don't try to customize it for yourself. When you're doing extractions, usually you divide that work up to a few people. Well, if everybody were going to say, uh, okay, well, I'm just going to add this column or I'm going to double that column and I, rather than having vital signs, I'm going to have one column for blood pressure and a column for heart rate. You have to decide these things a priori because after that, it's going to be very messy trying to merge two different sets of Excel spreadsheet. I'm going to take you a lot of time to go because if people added column here and column there, you won't just be able to cut and paste and then to match your 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 Excel spreadsheet with all of your your um, your data. Um, so I'll show you a little bit what this looked like, right? So this is when we get when we did the study for lipid fatalities a study that we published. So here is the initial of who did the first pass. Um, so this was Susan Smolenski. She's from New Mexico. So we all worked on, um, on a Google Sheet. So uh, if the PIDs not given are unclear, uh, then that was for extraction. Uh, year of the abstract, that was where we looked into the national poison data set. So that was their number, age, weight, gender, primary toxin, da, 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 da. And so those in yellow, we were not sure. Uh, red is usually probably an exclusion. And so you go on and you populate that table. Uh, so everybody does a first pass. And if you're using a shared EndNote or a shared management software, you can also highlight the key element in the abstract to make it easy for the person who's gonna go a second pass because you need at least two people to, to decide what to do. So if you're looking at this and you're sharing all of this, then you see, so, uh, Bob Hoffman, who looked after my extraction, then he put his name, then he just has to look at what I've written and look into the paper. And it, it's a lot faster and it's a lot easier than for everybody to have their own spreadsheet of their own paper and you having to merge that after. That, that's a nightmare. I've done it once and, and not again. No, it's just too long. So you use these shared, um, use your shared document to, to make your, your life easy. So once you've done all your studies and you say, you know what, this is a good one. We have enough data. We have enough this. So uh, either you put the extraction one in, in red and you keep the, the, the uncertain one in yellow and then the one that you want to keep in, in green. Then with all of your green studies, you're going to have to grade them. You're going to have to grade the quality of the evidence. So Grade Pro is a, a software that's free. It was built by uh, people in Ontario. Um, they will be helpful to evaluate the risk of bias uh, in toxicology. You know, we're going to look at timing, dosing, other treatment, you know, was the timing reported. You have to agree on what are you going to do with missing information? Are you going to code it as non-available or not reported? Whichever, but missing data has to be uh, coded as, as missing somewhere. So when you're looking at Grade Pro, you have in you know many languages. Uh, you can make summary of findings easy. Um, uh, you can look from Revman, or or after that you can. Um, there's a way from all of these uh, software manager 
to talk to each other. There's just, uh, you just have to export into different formats. So that's compatible with uh, with EndNote. And then lots and lots and lots of tutorial on, 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 uh, for you on how you can do uh, the grade pro um, things. And this is, a, I, I've given this presentation in 2017 to another group. Um, so that's why they wanted me to put all the links uh, on it. So I, I put them for, for them, but you can search for yourself. And it'll create uh, tables like this, right? So six studies, randomized trial, risk of bias, was it serious? The inconsistency, the indirectness, the imprecision, those are all things that you could do and you have to learn how to grade. So either you look at your methodologist or one of, you know, uh, one or two people in the group can look at the studies. It's helpful if you know what the topic is about. Uh, when we did, um, activated charcoal uh, systematic review that we just published this summer, we realized that there was no definition of what is inconsistent and what is indirect for toxicology. So we had to design a table for that. So we had to decide that indirectness could be, let's say, clinical symptoms because uh, what we really want would be a drug concentration. So if there was no concentration, but there were clinical symptoms consistent with you know, the expected uh, what the expected overdose, what that was a, a it lost point for indirectness because it's not as um, let's say as precise as a drug concentration. So that's something that you might have to create or you may have to look. And there's several several publications uh, that the grade group um, published to explain what is in precision, was in indirectness, and they give a lot of example. They just never had made one for toxicology. And then you will uh, put your number of patients, you'll put your summary of findings, and then it'll look at your quality of data and what is your importance. So it will help you build all of that, that will make you know, very, uh, very nice tables after this. So it's, it takes a little while to use, but after that, it's really uh, helpful uh, because it makes really beautiful table. And then you'll recognize the tables in several publications and you can say, haha, that's great pro. Um, this is what your EndNote manager should look like. Uh, so you have you have to have your Prisma statement and your study flow selection matching your uh, citation some, uh, software. So this was one that we did for the systematic review for the use of intraosseous antidote. And you see, we had 1,804 citation, 42 duplicates, 1,658 irrelevant, uh, 104 included for full text search. So we looked at all the articles that we excluded. And um, then after that, you can make these contexts. So finally, in the end of it, we included 50 articles. And then when you cross check the references, you can add one for a manual uh, edition. So when we had to make our Prisma, we all had our numbers here. And then you'll get a real headache if somehow you make you make um, <laughs> somehow you delete a, a citation that you shouldn't and your numbers don't add up because then you have to go and check you know all of why is this and why is that which is why this particular search I now do with Covidence and then Covidence would take up at uh, at this this uh, all included article you know it would take up here. But all the screen and all the full text and all of that, that confidence could, could be that repository. But when you don't have it and you've got to do it manually, this is a little bit what it looks like. And then you can subdivide it into animal studies, atropin, diazepam. Uh, you, can, you can make a difference into the included study and then subdivide these ones in terms of different overdose. So there's a lot of groups and group sets that you can create into your reference manager. So various pitfalls after you've done all of this um, is that you haven't defined uh, authorship management at the beginning. So anytime that you're recruiting somebody into your team, you've got to decide who's going to be the lead, who's going to be the one like or the senior, the oversight. Usually the senior will go last and the, the leader will go first author. But then you have to, um, to define authors versus collaborators to avoid um, a little bit of bickering at the end that somebody who says, well, why am I not including for author? I helped you find five full texts. And you're like, no, that doesn't qualify for authorship. You know, like, thank you. I could have asked my librarian for that. Um, 
or somebody who doesn't who contributes to extractions but how do you how do you divide up the work if somebody you know does i don't know like a hundred article extraction and somebody else does one or two they shouldn't you know like the, the one who does two or three extractions or looks over at conflict or you know can't have the same position on the authorship line than than somebody who worked really hard so if you define that a priori and if when you're asking I, the methodologist to help you out, are they going to go only in acknowledgement as collaborators or are they going to go into authors? So if you're getting a medical student to help you out, find a couple of full texts, does that qualify for authorship? So I encourage you to look at the um, ICGME uh, criteria for authorship and also to be very clear because you, you'll avoid a lot of pain after that when you have to discuss this with somebody who had different expectation and it's always unpleasant to have to discuss this after someone's helped you and they were expecting something that you don't think they quite deserve. So uh, be upfront at the beginning, that's gonna be uh, useful. And you can say to qualify for authorship, you have to extract at least 30 articles. You know, this is something that you could do. You know, you, you, you be transparent about what your expectations are. And if you can't do 30 articles, then, you know, you'll, you'll go into collaborators. Now what do you do if they're 29, right? Obviously it's always that kind of nonsense, but then you have to, uh, you just have to be clear and people, people get the gist that there are gonna be expectations and it's not gonna be a courtesy authorship just because they happen to look over at your manuscript. A systematic review is so much work depending on how many citations and articles you look at. You know, if you do a systematic review and you've got 16 citations and five papers, well, it's not the same thing. But when you're looking at all of that database, Try to try to divide up the work equally and and decide a priori what's going to qualify for authorship. Make sure you distribute your team. Your study selection have to be two people. Decide on the criteria beforehand. Uh, two pass data extraction. Your EndNote library needs to match your Prisma flow diagram. So plan, 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 plan ahead of time. Write your protocol, write your PICO, decide how you're going to do this. Um, ask for the relevant information so you don't have to extract two or three times. And really the transparency on how all, each of the studies were selected. Uh, use the tools to make your life easy. And there's lots of tutorials available online. So I'm going to try to see if the chat is active. Um, so outline the steps to conduct a systematic review. Does anyone can put that into the chat box? Big, big, broad steps. Define your data point, define your PICO. Yeah, yeah. What is it that you wanna do the systematic review for? Excellent. Then what goes next? Develop the search strategy, yes. Document the search, yes. Try to find your mesh term, work with the librarian. Your librarian won't be able to define your PICO, but you know it'll help you make the search to find the mesh term for your search. After that, Yes, two reviewers. Two reviewers, four. For study selection, yes, yeah, for the citation screen. All right, does anybody else with Audrey and the Chiefs uh, listening, putting in the chat? Use Covidence, yeah. Yeah, I see some of the names here that have done the journal club month with me. So this 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 is not new for you. We, we've discussed this. So Pico, develop a search strategy, do your study selection with your citation search and your study selection. Then after that.
sorry, I can't seem to figure out my chat on my phone, but uh, uh, go through and grade your articles. Yeah, grade your article, extract the data that's going to be uh, useful uh, for you. Grade your article, and then after that, synthesize the data. All right. Can you list me three tools that will make your job easier? EndNote, yeah. Providence. Either Ryan, right? Share document, okay? Providence, EndNote, and also the use of shared documents so you don't have multiple version of your document. And what are two common pitfalls to avoid? Yeah, discuss authorship. Make sure that the interested party have a say in so that you're extracting the data or you're gonna look at the data and, and discuss and reported um, uh, data or results that are meaningful for them. Yeah, make sure you have clinical relevant beside the criteria beforehand for selection. All right, then I guess you guys are all set. Huh? Um, I put in my two emails to look at that. And I also had a couple of slides to define the differences between the scope and review or the systematic review and how um, the <laughs> systematic review is slower with more explicit method, decreased risks of bias and is more comprehensive than the rapid scoping or the narrative review before. Um, so I'm happy to give a, a copy of those slides to the chief for distribution if you want it. And unless, uh, uh, how long it actually took me to complete your review on activated charcoal? Three years. We started with 16,000, no, was it 16,000 citation? And then actually we, we did it, um, for activated charcoal was a bit three years, but one year our systematic review was in review with the journal. So it took them one year to do the review on the journal. And then we went back and forth and back and forth because they wanted us to add a section on cathartics. And after that, they said, well, they were also expecting recommendations and we had to fight with them to say, no, the, the recommendation is, is not a systematic review. So all in all, it was probably two years uh, and there was COVID a little bit in between that. Uh, uh, and also before the start to the publication, uh, because it spent a year uh, with, uh, with systematic review, when they got back to us, we had to update it because the search had been too long. So we had to redo the search strategy for the year in between. So that's why it took some, uh, it took some time. But we were finally, yeah, yeah, this is not a resident project. Yeah, unless you start R1, right? Yeah, start R2 and by graduation you'll be done. No, but seriously, there's time like the systematic review, the, the intraosseous, um, the, the use of antidotes intraosseous, that, that took just a year to complete. Well, because we're all doing this, you know, uh, outside of our, our regular job, but we thought that was important. And that's really a question that came out from the pharmacist to say, hey, which antidote can we give IO if we can't get an IV? And so we did that systematic review. We asked the pharmacist, we asked the physician. Um, and this is why we looked at whether or not there was a difference into the site of intraosseous as well, because they say, well, is it the same if we give it pre-tibial or if we give it humoral? So we added that as one of extraction factor. We didn't find anything, but we did, we did, um, uh, we did uh, think of asking what would be meaningful for, for people. Thank you so much, Dr. Gustin. I think that was very clear. I'm sure the resident will appreciate the slide. So I'll send you a, an email right after the presentation, just as well. Sure, I noticed a few typos, so I'll correct it before sending the PDF to you. No problem. <laughs> I'm sure All right, you guys, can do I with really the go. Thank you. Okay, bye. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye bye. Okay. Um, so that was a lot of information over the past hour. So I think we're going to take a, a, a five minute break. Um, and then Dr. Peng will give us our second ultrasound lecture of the day um, on epocus renal. So uh, just we'll say five minutes just to kind of let our minds clear a little bit. And at 11.09, we'll come back and we can get started on the last presentation of the day.
all righty everybody we'll we'll get going again here so dr pang are ready when you are Dr. Bang, is it possible you're muted? Okay, does everyone see my screen? Yeah, I did mute myself. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to yeah, just make you. sure you see the video as well. Okay, excellent. All right. Okay, so we'll get started right away. Um, this presentation can be as short as we want, so I'll just keep track of timing and uh, stop uh, right at the 15 minute mark for a five minute question. So we'll talk very briefly about renal ultrasound. Um, uh, again, you know, whenever we look at ultrasound, it really, you know, is more the renal and the bladder system, but for sake of, uh, uh, for sake of, um, uh, essentially briefness today, we'll talk only about the renal. Just a few uh, minutes about image acquisitions. So of course, your patient will be supine. The point where we start scanning is really the posterior axillary point or posterior axillary line on both the right and left side. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the kidneys are a partially intrathoracic organ. So you do have to maneuver yourself, rotate to spread yourself between the rib to get a good view. Essentially, like any organ, um, perhaps not emphasized enough for the kidneys, we really want to view the organ in two axes. So just as you view the heart in both, you know, sub xiphoid and maybe a personal long and personal short, the kidney really should be viewed in two point as well, one in the longitudinal and also in the short axis. Quickly going through the um, ultrasound anatomy. So here we have the renal pyramid, which on ultrasound appears hypoechoic, okay, or black. This is where the, all the concentration of the urine occurs. After that, it passes through calyces, which are these little channels, and the calyces coalesce to form the renal pelvis, then, which then goes down to the ureter. So very important to distinguish, really, the calyces from the medulla which sometimes can appear as hydronephrosis. Essentially, when we're, looking at, uh, when we're looking at renal ultrasound, we're answering, we're trying to answer one question, right? Is there hydronephrosis? That's really the point of ED ultrasound to see whether there's presence of hydronephrosis. Hydronephrosis can be graded as mild, moderate, or severe. So how do you know which one is mild, which one is moderate, which one is severe? So between mild and moderate, it's really to look at the calyces. The calyces, as I said, were, those are those little channels that collect urine. Usually they should be convex, right? So if you can take a look at the drawing, these are curved inward or convex. In my hydronephrosis, even though the calyces are dilated, they still appear um, sorry, uh, concave, where in moderate uh, hydronephrosis, it kind of changes. It changed the, the nice concave orientation, changed to more convex orientation. It looks like it's more ballooned outside, um, but you can see that there is still the echogenic line that's separating the collecting system from the renal parenchyma, so it's not completely obliterated, as you can see over here. When does it become more of a severe um, hydronephrosis? What you see is that the collecting system is dilated. It affects even the renal parenchyma. So it even invades into the renal parenchyma. And there's really no difference between the collect system. There's like very, very small differentiation between renal collecting system and the parenchyma. That's when they call severe. Now, the differentiation between my moderate severe is more of a 
I guess, medical jargon for you to communicate to a consultant or for you to communicate to the next person taking over from your shift. You know, um, do they really correspond to how severe the disease are to a certain degree, but they're not the only um, tool there to, de to determine how severe the renal, um, the kidneys are impaired by the obstructive changes. So just a quick review, take a look at this clip. Do you think this is more moderate, more mild, or more severe based on the definition that we kind of went through? Um, so you'll probably have to unmute your mics because I can't really see the um, um, the uh, text window. Getting a mix of moderate and severe. Yeah, it's more moderate uh, on this one, but you know, um, I agree it's kind of you know moderate severe in the spectrum. As long as you didn't say it's mild, it's good. All right, and what about this one? I'd say mild. Yeah, it's pretty mild, right? You can see that it's a bit dilated. You can see that the calyces are still more or less convex. Oh, sorry, concave. They still have that inward shape. And what about this one? Severe. So this one is actually mild to moderate, um, but I can understand why you say severe because it seems like there's a shadow over here that's casted, right? That's more of a hydroureter than hydronephrosis. So that's a good, important distinguish to make. Hydroureter can occur with hydronephrosis or without. Hydroureter is essentially the ureter themselves that's more dilated and hydronephrosis more with reflecting on the state of the kidney themselves, the kidney pelvis. So you do see hydroureter here, you see perhaps mild to moderate hydronephrosis here, but one of the things that we wanna train our eyes on is not to just focus on the organ, but also take a look at the surrounding. And if you take a look at the surrounding, is there something that bothers you? Yeah, there's a little bit of fluid, right? So I'm just wondering if it's encapsulated or is it really like free fluid or it's 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 true. It, it, it looks more near to the kidney than actually in the pouch. Sure. So that's a really that's a really important observation that you just, you just made there because the fluid that is surrounding the kidney, we often say that look, if you're looking at the interface between the kidney and the liver, that's where you find free fluid. That is true to a certain extent. There could be perinephritic stranding or perinephritic fluid under two forms, either urine that's being leaked outside of the kidney or hematoma that's formed around the kidney. So the only way to distinguish between a perinephritic free fluid and whether there's actually free fluid in the abdomen, really the important thing is just to move your probe to the uh, lower down, so more towards the feet and look for pockets of fluid um, at the tip of the liver to see if there's any intra-abdominal aspect of the fluid. But we're really what we're looking at is a urea, uh, it's a, essentially, this is a picture of um, um, like a collecting system that has ruptured and this is urine surrounding the kidney. But the differential would include either urine, um, inflammatory fluid, or in the right context, hematoma surrounding the kidney. So as I said before, you know, the degree of hydronephrosis doesn't really dictate how severe the disease can be. Its presence indicate that there's obstructive changes, but there's other signs that point to the severity of the pathology that you're looking at. So it's, to, it's really important to distinguish whether it's severe, moderate, or mild to kind of get an idea of degree of obstruction, but that's not all that goes into determining the pathology, the severity of the pathology itself. Okay. So true or false, the inability of ultrasound to detect a stone does not rule out a stone. In other words, if you don't see a stone ultrasound, doesn't mean that there is no stone. 
What do you guys think? I say true. I mean, it's true. true. Yeah. yeah, yeah, easy one, right? We'll start easy. So large proximal stones are really easy to see, but they're often not the cause. So if you see a stone, and often we do see a lot of people with stone in the renal pelvis, they're not really causing obstruction, they're just there. But they could be a source of smaller stone, which can later cause symptoms. The other thing is that you could see very distal stones at the UVJ. And in fact, in twinkle artifact, which I'll show later, can kind of help you to detect these stones and kind of bring highlight them out. But anything between the renal pelvis or the very, very proximal um, uh, UPJ and the UVJ, anything in between is, is really poorly visualized by point of care ultrasound. So if you want to know exact location of the stone, you don't see it in either point, you really need to go for a CT or KUB, depends on the center that you're working at. It depends on your protocols. So what is the twinkle artifact? The twinkle artifact is essentially a color Doppler artifact. So it doesn't exist for real, but it's an artifact that shows a very, um, I guess, uh, essentially uh, color Doppler behind a stone. And this is kind of essentially very, very closely related to a shadow artifact, but under color. And what that does is that if you put your Doppler over what you think a stone is, you'll see what we call aliasing, which is a multitude of colors behind the stone itself. And this is where we can really bring it out, you know? All right, next question, true or false? The absence of hydronephrosis rules out obstructive nephrolithiasis. So if there is no hydronephrosis, the stone is not obstructive. False. Yeah, false. So what can influence the development of hydronephrosis? It takes time to develop, right? It doesn't go right away. If you think of, uh, you know, a, a sink that's blocked, you know, it takes time for the water to build up and to cause an, to cause an appearance of obstruction. Also, if you don't have a lot of urine production because you're dehydrated, because you're vomiting, you're vomiting because of the pain, it really hinders the development of hydronephrosis. In fact, about one third of obstructive stone don't actually show hydronephrosis. So the presence, while the presence of hydronephrosis does confirm that there is obstructive stone, the absence of it doesn't confirm that there is no stone. It's important to take that in mind as well. All right, true or false? Obstructive nephrolithiasis causes unilateral absence of ureteral jet. So if you look at the bladder, if it's obstructive, you don't see jet on that side. I guess, again, with the same concept, if they're not producing any urine, you won't see it. But at the same time, if they're not producing urine, they won't have unilateral, they'll have bilateral non, like no jet on both sides. Never but mind. I guess the question is, if the stone <laughs> is obstructive, would you see a jet? No. Well, the, the, the obstruction could be partial, no? And then you could, so I, I so you could see a, a jet in some occasion. That's a really good reasoning, and that's true. So it's true that when we say obstructive stone, we don't say completely obstructive stone. Completely obstructive stone is actually pretty not rare, but you see it, it's 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 a it's an entity that is pretty rare. So when we look at um, the ureteral jet, it's actually a pretty difficult scan to do because the thing is that you have to really look that over five minutes. And it's not the absence that you're looking at. You're looking at a relatively decreased frequency of the jet over five minutes compared to the unaffected side. So whenever I see people kind of just looking for jet, it's a great initiative, but just means that just because you don't see it at that point when you see the jet from the other side doesn't mean that you know doesn't mean that there's no jet from the affected side. And if you do see jet from the affected side, doesn't mean the stone is not obstructive. You know, so these are all things that are not a hundred percent sensitive. I think in in just relatively term, the urinary jet it's test that takes a lot of time, and the you know effort that goes into it versus the reward that it gives is is not. Uh, I feel like it's not really a test that, you know, worth five minutes of me standing there and 
looking for chat, but you can make your own conclusions. All right, so what are the mimics of hydronephrosis? So other than, you know, because of uh, um, what are the things that looks like hydronephrosis, but they are not quite hydronephrosis? Cysts. Yeah, cysts, but specifically parapelvic cysts, right? Cysts that are right there in the pelvis that looks like it's a dilated pelvis. Good. What else? In mass, I'm sure. Yeah, a mass of some kind. Um, so either like a congenital extra renal pelvis, right? Or maybe a duplication or maybe a vascular mass. That's what we're really looking at, right? So that's what the, that's one of the mimics that would be important to distinguish. So there's a lot of things that are called pseudo hydronephrosis. So like pseudo hypokalemia, it's things that looks like that, look like hydronephrosis, but not quite, um, you know, actually hydronephrosis. So any kind of cyst that's around the pelvis can mimic hydronephrosis. Congenital con conditions can mimic hydronephrosis, but the parapelvic cysts and the congenital conditions, they're really clinically relevant, right? If you have an extra renal pelvis, it's good to know and kind of good to you know, get the urologist involved as an outpatient, but really from the emergency point of view, it's not a, it's, you know, an extra renal pelvis doesn't really give you any issues, but vascular malformations would, right? These are the things that we need to kind of look for and distinguish from hydronephrosis. So vascular malformation like renal sinus varices, AV malformation, or even renal artery aneurysm can look a lot like hydronephrosis. And the only thing that distinguishes it is Doppler. So whenever you're looking at something that looks like hydronephrosis, just to confirm, put the color on it, just make sure it's not a vascular malformation and you can rest easy. So these are two examples of um, things that mimic hydronephrosis. One of them is a cyst and the other one is aneurysm. It's really hard to distinguish which one is which, right? If you'd have to take a guess, you know, which one on the right or the left that you think is the aneurysm? The right. Like this right or it's this right? Uh, screen right. Screen I'm, right, I'm yeah. Guess, yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah, right, that looks like maybe, but you're not sure. So let's put color on it. It's an aneurysm. Whenever you see something that you don't understand, that's cystic structure, very, very important, you know, not just in the context of uh, renal scan. Whenever you see something that's cystic, put color on it, make sure it's not an aneurysm or AVFM malformation. All right, and one last one. What are the other, other than nephronothiasis, what other pathology might result in hydronephrosis? You can have a like some mass causing an obstruction from cancer, from a large cyst, a hematoma, any mass causing obstruction, basically. So let's separate them into bilateral and unilateral. So I agree, any kind of mass that's outside as well, right? So pelvic tumor usually tend to produce bilateral hydronephrosis and then urothelial malignancy that's compressing either from the outside or from the, actually the urothelial tract can cause hydronephrosis. Any kind of fibrosis in the retroperitoneal area or stricture. A really important thing to remember is that you can also get the hydronephrosis from pyelonephritis just from the inflammation and the edema from the uh, ureters. And that's all for... Um, a very, very quick review on kidney ultrasound. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Great. Great. Uh, Go ahead. Any Dave. questions? No, do you have any, um, any questions from anyone? All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Pang, for that. That was great. A great review and um, lots of nice differentials there as well. Um, and thanks uh, for being um, malleable with the, the timing today. Sorry that we were running behind. No so, problem. Great. Okay. Right. So that wraps it up.
for today. Thanks everyone for sticking around. Um, not much more to add. Thank, thanks everyone who's already contributed to the slush fund. I really appreciate it. Um, it they'll contribute to many more nice socks and uh, other things that will be uh, much appreciated by the people who will benefit from them. And trust me, it's not me. I'm not har like harboring all of your cash and just gonna, you know, anyway. Mm -hmm. So maybe just a reminder for the senior teaching on 1 p.m. that Beck has given. And I think that's it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. Uh, no, Dre, oh. um, we, I, I have to speak with Vincent for the site exam. There's this issue on how we're going to administer it as Allison has to be uh, available, but we're selling that hopefully this week. So we'll give you news. But it will be, it has to be like at the latest early November. Yes, we can do it online, but then needs, I, I asked about it, there needs to be some type of monitoring um, to make sure that we don't go over time. So we're looking at either like few date option and people can either do both exam at the same time and have six hours or do twice two hours. It's just that we can't ask Allison to be available all the time for that to monitor the time of the exam as she sent it to you and you have to send it back. So that if, if, if we don't all write it at approximately the same time, like same day, it would require Allison to monitor all 26 of us, like at, in, in terms of keeping track of all of our timing, which um would be a lot for, for one person to handle. And doing it on the Monday of the retreat as we had planned, it really seemed to make sense, but it, apparently there's more residents that we thought who could not be there on Monday because they either have shift or post nights or stuff like that. And Vincent was stuck in not, and I, like we fully understand like he can't take residents away from rotation so close to the time. So that's the issue that's being raised. Yeah. It, it will be held online. It, it just has to do with start and end time. Alrighty. Any other okay. questions guys? Okay, bye. Bye-bye.